into northern England and Wales through the night. They'll crop up across parts of the south during the early hours. It will be a chilly old night, though. Four or five in towns and cities, lower across parts of northern England, southern Scotland, a hint of blue on the chart. Some rural spots could easily start below freezing uh, tomorrow morning. So again, a chilly start, but for many quite a sunny start tomorrow. Main exception to that will be Northern Ireland. Cloud moving in here, uh, a dull, damp day, and some of that rain will spread to southwest Scotland, North Wales later on. Sprinkling of showers over parts of the east, but again, many places dodging the showers, dry and bright. But again, for most, on the cool side. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Very good morning. We've got the result this morning of this significant legal case. Catherine Burblesing, Britain's strictest head. Will she have to provide a prayer room for the Muslim students at lunchtime? Yeah, massive implications for schools and I would argue for other public mm. sectors. We're rather hoping she wins because she's terrific and she's got a great school already. Yeah. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding on the M60 in Greater Manchester. Four out of five lanes are closed anti-clockwise after an accident between junctions 19 and 18 from Eaton Park to Simister Island. It's just the outside lane that's open past the scene causing queues. On the M6 in Staffordshire, two out of three lanes are closed southbound where a lorry caught fire between junctions 16 and 15 near Stoke-on-Trent causing delays. On the M6 in Warwickshire, the southbound exit at junction 3, the Coventry and Uneaton turn is closed for emergency barrier repairs. On the M25 in Essex, there are anti-clockwise delays, taking three quarters an hour from junction 28 for the A12 to 26 at Waltham Abbey after an accident earlier. And on the M3 in Hampshire, the outside lanes closed southbound after an accident between junctions 11 and 12 from south of Winchester towards Eastley causing queues. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. This is GB News. Britain's news channel. The perception of a crime being committed um, is not based on whether that person intended to commit a crime or not, but whether the victim, in inverted commas, uh, or anybody else for that matter who happened to hear whatever was said, uh, determines that um, it was motivated by malice or ill will. Most of these things come out in, in heated exchanges or in you know very casual exchanges. Mm. Uh, and then somebody says oh, I'm offended or I'm hurt or I'm whatever because this was clearly uh, malicious and it's against me as a, uh, a, a black person um, or a, a transgender uh, or sexual uh, sexuality, whatever it might be. And somebody says, I perceive this to be uh, motivated by hate. Mm -hmm. Now, at that point, the, what is the reasonable test um, that anybody could apply as to what was in somebody's mind at the time. You don't know what I'm thinking now. I don't know what you're thinking now. Why is it that a crime can be committed on the basis of what somebody is alleged to be thinking? Well, that's also how discrimination often works, because people have worked out these days that saying something or sending an email like one I received some years ago that said, let's go round her place with pickaxe handles and balaclavas and see what we can do. Now, that's an email that was sent about me. People have worked out that you don't do that, but from the circumstance of what happens, if racial taunts were being shouted, if taunts about someone's protective, protective characteristic were being shouted in the run-up to what then happened, it would be pretty obvious that that was a hate crime. But we know, for example, that street preachers have been arrested, uh, merely for quoting the Bible, um, and without actually intending you know, in anything beyond that. Good morning, 9.30 on Tuesday the 16th of April. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. So Liz Truss tells all. I hate being told what to do. Yeah, I know. And I hate all. the government telling other people <laughs> what to do. And having well, spent 10 years in the government, I can tell you it generally doesn't know best. Well, I think I agree with that. The former Prime Minister Liz Truss back with a new book, 10 Years to Save the West. But were the Tories better off? keeping her in the top job. 
And a very significant morning, a Muslim prayer ban ruling. The Michaela Trust School in London is set to discover this morning whether a Muslim student has won a challenge against its ban on prayer rituals. This could have huge implications for everybody. Smoke-free generation. At least 50 Tory MPs are going to vote against Rishi Sunat's flagship plans to try to ban smoking when it comes before the Commons this afternoon. But do you support the ban on cigarettes for anyone born after 2009? GB News presenter Nigel Farage is at the National Conservatism Conference in Brussels this morning. We're going to be dipping into his speech when he takes to the stage. There was a very sad car crash just a few days ago at a shop, near a shopping centre in, East, in London. Three young boys, all killed. Uh, there's a move now. Are young teenagers responsible enough as drivers to have a car full of passengers? We're yeah. going to be talking to a mum. That's right. If you remember, there was that awful crash in November of last year in Snowdonia in a really beautiful location and a car went off a bridge and there were four young men in that car who died. We're going to be having a conversation here in the studio with one of the mothers who lost her son that day to talk about this new, potential new uh, legislation. Get in touch this morning, gbnews.com forward slash your say to be involved in the programme. First though, the very latest news with Tatiana Sanchez. Bev, thank you very much and good morning. The top stories. The Prime Minister is expected to urge Benjamin Netanyahu to show restraint in his response to Iran's missile and drone attack. Rishi Sunak is among world leaders warning the Israeli Prime Minister to avoid escalation in the Middle East amid concerns the crisis could spiral out of control. Reports suggest Israeli forces have paused their planned ground offensive in Rafah to focus on their response against Iran. The UN claims it's concerned about the possibility of nuclear facilities could be targeted in a revenge attack. However, Iranian president says even the smallest action against Iran will be met with a severe, widespread and painful response. The government's flagship Rwanda bill is heading back to the House of Lords after MPs rejected a series of amendments peers made to the legislation. Eyes to the right, 315, the nose to the left, 250. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Unlock. The Lords had raised a number of concerns, including allowing individual asylum appeals based on safety. However, after a debate in the House of Commons last night, MPs dismissed all changes, with some Conservatives calling the proposed changes ridiculous. Downing Street's hoping to clear the final hurdle this week and get flights off the ground within weeks. But Labour insists the scheme is doomed to fail. Now an update on the situation in Copenhagen where a large fire has broken out at one of the city's oldest buildings. If you're watching this on television, these are the latest pictures coming to us from the scene as thick smoke continues to billow into the sky. Earlier, emergency crews were seen rushing to the old stock exchange after the building's iconic spire collapsed into the roof. There were no reports of any injuries at this stage. The Prime Minister is facing the prospect of a rebellion as his plans to stop young people from smoking is brought before the Commons for the first time today. Should the tobacco and vapes bill be passed into law, it would see an be an offence to sell tobacco products to anyone born after the 1st of January 2009. This means children aged 15 or younger today will never legally be able to buy a cigarette. The bill would make the sale of tobacco products rather than the act of smoking illegal. And the rate of unemployment in the UK has risen by more than expected and growth in earnings has eased back again. The Office for National Statistics says unemployment increased to 4.2% in the three months to February. That's the highest rate for six months. Regular wages, excluding bonuses, grew by 6% in the same period from 6.1% in the previous three months. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Andrew and Bev.
Very good morning, 9.35 on Tuesday morning. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with me, Beth Turner, and Andrew Pearce. So, she's everywhere, isn't she? The former Prime Minister Liz Truss has released her new book, Ten Years to Save the West. And last night she spoke with Nigel Farage on GB News. Here's what she had to say. I was the only Conservative in the room yeah. for many years, and it's not working. You know, the West is weak. Uh, we're seeing authoritarian regimes on the, on the rise. And what we're also seeing is in our own societies, our very values being undermined. You know, the things we believe in, our nation, the family, individual freedom, all of those core values are being undermined. And that is what my book is about. I hate being told what to do. Yeah, I know. And I hate more. the government telling other people uh, what to do. And having well, spent 10 years in the government, I can tell you it generally doesn't know best. We've had a Whitehall that's been shaped by being in Europe, you know, essentially supplicants to Europe. And it's almost like, what is that syndrome when you become a hostage and you start to love Stockholm. your... Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. It's almost like that. You know, mm. Officials were constantly looking to Brussels for validation. And you know, all of that needed to change. Well, Tony Blair is, uh, John, sorry, John McTernan is Tony Blair's former political secretary and he was not impressed by what Liz Truss said last night. Well, of course he wasn't. The main thing, the, the big turn that came across was it was always somebody else's fault. Liz Truss was in the cabinet, eventually became prime minister, in the cabinet for nine years. Tony was only in the cabinet for ten. Uh, and yet Liz Truss was unable to do anything. It was always somebody else's fault. Now, is that a fair assessment, do you think, Andrew Pearce of Lister? Uh, You've read the book. I have. You've interviewed her about this. I have read the book, and I've known her a long time, and I've read the book, and the book's quite interesting. She doesn't uh, try and shift the blame to everybody else. She does blame a lot of other people, but she accepts things were done wrong. Mm. But she was, no doubt, the, the blob, the, the Treasury, got her. Mm. But if you sack the chief Mandarin on day one, that's a man called Scholar, Tom Scholar, and don't have someone to replace him or her... You're in trouble. Yeah. Well, and they were out together. And, and, she, and, and she even has gone so far as to say it was the deep state yeah. that did for her. We're joined now by the political editor at HuffPost, Kevin Schofield, and the former MEP for London, Lance Foreman. So this book is out uh, this week, gentlemen. A lot of people discussing it. But does it really tell us anything that we didn't already know, do you think, about Liz Truss and how she will be viewed in history as the Prime Minister who was there for the shortest time, Kevin? No, I mean, I think her views now are very well known. As, as you say, she has been absolutely everywhere. You can't open a paper or turn on the TV without seeing Liz Truss being interviewed. Um, she's certainly very forthright in getting her message across. I'm sure it will do her book sales, maybe not in this country, but on the other side of the Atlantic. She'll probably do quite well. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'll pick up there on what Andrew said. You know, you're right, she got rid of Tom Scholar on day one, and I think that sort of set the scene for the next 49 days that, that she was in power. You know, she was in too much of a rush, trying to get everything done yesterday, um, and ultimately it blew up in her face. Although she is trying to shift the blame onto quite a lot of people, I think ultimately she only has herself to blame for that particular strategy. Um, Lance, she very much talks about the fact that there's nothing... She could achieve nothing. There were too many hurdles in her way. There were too many uh, people. She almost talks about forces in her way to get a growth economy and to move away from what she sees as sort of left-wing ideology from all of the other countries as well that she mentioned in that interview with Nigel uh, last night. Is she right? Um, I think she is right. I think we are living in this world where, you know, the forces, you know, the establishment, whether it's the Treasury, the Bank of England, and, and even a lot of her colleagues in the Conservative Party are just sort of stuck in this, uh, this world looking at sort of tax and spend the whole time without actually looking about the underlying incentives that make economies grow. Mm. And, you know, we, you know, that's why our economy has stagnated for the last 30 years. It's really not that complicated. You know, if you want an economy to grow, what you have to do is incentivize people by having lower taxes and scrapping red tape. And red tape has got completely out of hand. Tax levels at the highest they've been for a generation. And she wanted to change that. And I also think, you know, if you go back to the... And this wasn't about Brexit, but if you go back to the Brexit vote, I think there was a sense amongst the British people 
But they just felt that our country was stagnating and they they, they wanted to be bold and try something different. And, and yeah, they might have felt that, you know, pulling out of Europe was the thing we needed to do. But they wanted bold change and we haven't had bold change in, in our leadership. And, and Liz Truss tried it and unfortunately she was held back by her colleagues. Mm. Why, but, is it, but in your view, Lance, I mean, she only lasted seven weeks. Humiliating, frankly, the, the shortest serving prime minister in history. I think unless there's a death, that record is never going to be uh, mm. beaten. So why did she fail so quickly, in your view? Um, you know, I, I wish she would have said the lady is not for turning when they sort of locked her in, her, in that room and said, you need to reverse everything you've just done. Mm. Um, she needed to show strength at that time. And she, she said, I mean, she's told me that the reason she, you know, she was unable to was because she just didn't have the support of her parliamentary colleagues, despite the actual party sort of backing what she was trying to achieve. And it wasn't as though it was a great surprise. You know, t people talk about this mini budget as a surprise. That summer hustings just went on and on, and she kept setting out what she was trying to achieve. People knew, and they voted for her on that basis. I think she was really badly let down by her colleagues that thought Rishi Sunak would do a better job. And actually, what 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 we have now is, you know, he, he's performing certainly in polling terms even worse than she did at that time. Mm. So I think I think it was a huge mistake to get rid of her. They should have given her a, a, a much greater chance. And, and I think her policies were absolutely spot on. They were hailed by a lot of the newspapers. You know, the, 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 the front pages said at last the Tory budget. All the business groups, the CBI, the the, um, the IOD, the Institute of Directors, the Federation of Small Businesses, they all said, this is just the budget we need. And, and I'm a businessman. I agree. I thought it was a fantastic budget and really, really unhappy that, uh, that she was deposed. Kevin Schofield, the Labour Party, indeed, in, in fact, even accepted one of her tax cuts. Uh, after that mini budget, um, uh, they don't talk about that very much now. But if you look at the polls, Rishi Sunak has plummeted to minus uh, an approval rating of minus 27 and a half percent in the latest poll on Conservative Home. That is an approval rating for ministers. No Tory leader has ever scaled such a low depth. So he's far more less popular now than Liz Truss. They probably should have stuck with her. Well, the whole thing about bringing in Rishi Sunak was he was supposed to be uh, the sensible, moderate man in the room that he would, um, you know, stop the boat from rocking, and that the plan was that um, he was popular in the public, not least because of the furlough and all the money that he gave away to people during mm -hmm. uh, lockdown, and that he would then bring the Conservative Party's ratings up to where he was at. When in actual fact, the opposite has happened. His ratings have, have plummeted down to where. The Conservative parties are, people have had a look at him for the last 18 months and have decided that he's not up to the job. So I guess it's one of the great what ifs. You know, what if the, the Conservatives had stood by Liz Trust, what would have happened? I think, though, if you cast your mind back to that particular time, I think, you know, the momentum behind the moves to get rid of her were unstoppable. Uh, I remember at the Conservative Party conference, she'd, she'd only been leader for a few weeks and already there was every Conservative MP you spoke to virtually was saying she's not going to last. Yeah. So Christmas, so really, um, she wasn't, if you want to defend her, you'd say she wasn't really given a chance. That said, I do think she was the author of, of her own misfortune. Lance, would it have been better if she'd had a chance of the Exchequer who'd actually worked in the Treasury before or been a Treasury Minister, or was that part of the strength? She was bringing somebody in who would look at it from a completely different perspective. Um, look, to some extent, I feel she was stitched up by both the Treasury and the Bank of England. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the biggest problem here was the problem with the LDIs, the, the liability-driven investments, which she wasn't briefed on. Nobody in the Treasury briefed her about it. The Bank of England knew about this and never said a word. And the reason we, we know they knew was because their own pension fund had 100% of its investments invested in LDIs. Lance, the summer Lance, could before. You, just can I interrupt you, could you could just explain in layman's terms what these are and why they were so significant and why it went, made such a bad impact on what she was trying to do? Yeah, it, it, it is really important. It's difficult to explain in, 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 a, in, a, in a sound bite, but essentially, um, after the, the, the crash in the early part of the 2000s, um, pension funds weren't allowed to invest in equity in risk, what were considered to be risky investments. 
So they invested in bonds. And as we know, bonds just gave a very low rate of it. It's basically like investing in a bank account. You get a very low rate of interest. And so they weren't earning enough money to be able to pay out people's pensions once they retired. So this new vehicle came along called an LDI. And what they said to the pension funds is, if you give us the security of these bonds, we will lend you more money to invest in more LDIs. And then if you give us the security of those LDIs, we'll lend you more money to invest in more. So it was like a giant Ponzi scheme. Yeah, exactly. And the problem with that, so and that, that enabled pension funds to earn more. But the problem is when interest rates go up and interest rates needed to go up because inflation was getting out of control because of what happened during COVID and Rishi Sunak you know, printing all this money and handing it out. So when interest rates go up, bond values go down because people want to sell the bonds they had because they can earn more money buying new bonds which have a mm. high, rate, high rate of interest. So bond values were collapsing because they were collapsing and um, these pension funds were invested in them. They had to sell more bonds to pay off the ones that were collapsing and then sell more bonds. So and you had a sort of Ponzi scheme that was crashing. Yeah, and, and, and effectively her, her premiership became the, the victim of that very obscure, in a way, fiscal phenomenon. I'm so sorry, gentlemen, we've run out of time. Um, Kevin Schofield and Lance Foreman, thank you so much. We could have been chatting when, uh, when, for a while. When I interviewed her last week, she talked endlessly about those LDIs. Oh, really? That's what keeps her awake, keep awake at night. Um, big morning. Catherine Burble Singh, you will know her, Britain's strictest head. She is in court. She was in court a few months ago. We talked about this. Should she be forced to provide a room at lunchtime for the Muslim students to pray? She says if no. she does so, it will fundamentally change the way that her school runs. She has the most successful performing state school in the country. And we're going to be bringing you the results of that court case this morning. Don't go anywhere. You're with Britain's Newsroom on GB News. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Offline and overlooked. That's what Age UK say millions of British pensioners are. Why? Because they cannot or won't access the internet. It's leading to digital exclusion. So the charities campaigning for public services like banks, utilities and even the NHS to maintain a more human approach. Everything's online. People assume you've got a smartphone with a, with a mobile number and uh, an email and without that you don't exist in this world anymore. We've got to try and get the government to see that it's so important to make people feel that they belong because there's a, there's a feeling that the older generation just feel that they're forgotten, they're in the way and we already know that anyway. But it's just another reason for them to feel that they're not wanted. They'll just accept it and they'll say, well, that's it, I can't do it anymore. And that's it, whereas other people would be really kicking and screaming. So we need to be the voice for older people. Despite digital technology playing an increasing role in our lives, around one in five over 65s in the UK don't use the internet. Thornycroft Centre in Pontefract, West Yorkshire, provides a space for this age group to socialise and get help to go online. I'm not that good with mobiles, so when you mention anything about online, I ain't a clue what you're talking about. The closure of thousands of banks is also detrimental to the older generation. A lot of our members what come, they tend to use cash. Um, they don't like to use bank cards. I think a lot of it's trust or the lack of knowledge. They don't understand how it works. I think they're very vulnerable as well with online. It's really important that they're aware how to use it and how to use it safely. So in an online era, it's still crucial for many to have an offline option. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out.
with my panel here on Jubes & Co. We debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Very good morning, 9.50. So, the Prime Minister's flagship policy to ban smoking will be voted on by MPs today. It was designed to outlaw anyone born after 20, 2009 from buying cigarettes. So, is it time to ban young people from smoking and make sure that they never can? Well, joining us now is the Director of Forest Smoking, Simon Clark, and Deborah Arnold, the Chief Executive of Action on Smoking. We don't have a huge amount of time, uh, both of you, but, Simon, let's start with you. Should we make it so that anybody born after 2009 can never buy cigarettes? No, I think it's a pathetic gimmick that dreamt up at the fag end of Rishi Sunak's time in office. He wants to leave a legacy. Smoking's an easy target. This policy will infantilise adults. When you're 18, you're legally an adult and you should be treated like one. I mean, at 18, you can drive a car, join the army, possess a credit card, you can purchase alcohol and, of course, you can vote. So if you can do all those things at 18, mm. you should be allowed to make an informed choice to uh, purchase tobacco. Uh, and Deborah, also, this is going to fuel on. the black market. Simon, very clear. Deborah, your life, your choice. Well, Simon would say that because he's paid by the tobacco industry. He doesn't smoke himself, but he wants others to take that risk. And it's not what the public want and it's not what smokers want. Um, I mean, Forrest published a push poll yesterday, but um, on Radio 4, Luke Trill from... Uh, a large polling company um, and YouGov polls and all the polls show that the public support it. The majority of people who can vote conservative support it. It's not anti-conservative. Um, and um, smoking is going to be consigned to the ash heap of history. And that's where it deserves to be, because it's the leading cause of premature death. But Deborah, I, I mean, I get that, and I don't like smoking. I would like people to stop smoking. But the law will create a, 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 an extraordinary situation where somebody born after 2009 can't legally buy cigarettes, say, in five years' time. They could be sharing a house with three adults who were born the year before who can. How can that be right? Um, because it's bringing it in for people who don't, you know, aren't currently old enough to, to smoke. Um, I mean, it's an incremental policy. It's actually heralding the end of smoking. It's not criminalising smoking. It's not criminalising buying tobacco, but it will make it harder for young people to get hold of cigarettes. Um, and that's how we will actually reduce smoking, because when the smoking age was increased from 16 to 18, it reduced smoking rates in 16 and 17 year olds by 30%. And, you know, this is still a problem. And increasingly, it's adults who are starting smoking and becoming addicted. And this is not about free choice, because once you're addicted, it's really difficult to quit. Um, UCL so analysis shows 350 18 to 25 year olds become regular smokers each day. Regular smokers are addicted smokers and um, take on average 30 attempts to quit. Many fail and will die from smoking. So, Simon, the state has a responsibility to protect you from yourself. Uh, the state has a responsibility to educate people about the health risks of smoking, drinking too much alcohol, all sorts of things. The state does not have responsibility to coerce adults never to take up a perfectly legal product. This is not about protecting children. The illegal age of sale is already 18. So if you want to stop children smoking, the answer is to crack down on illicit sellers not adults who choose to smoke. And, of course, creeping prohibition is going to fuel the black market. Well, that That's going to benefit criminal gangs and other illicit sellers. It will not help mm -hmm. children. OK, thank you both. Sorry, really so great short. debate. Sorry we're so short on time. Simon Clark there and Deborah Arnott. Like you say, maybe it was thought up at the fag end of what? Rishi Sunak's uh, Premier uh, I don't like banning things, but I'm, I'm troubled by this. Yeah, this me too. Really. <clears throat> um, yeah. Right, uh, here's your weather. Alex Deakin. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Another fresh start out there this morning. Many of us seeing sunny spells. There will be a few showers, but it's not as many, not as heavy as the ones we saw yesterday. Still, it's a bit of a wet start over parts of Lincolnshire down through East Anglia. A fair few showers scattered across Wales as well. We'll see more coming into northern Scotland through the day. Still a fairly brisk breeze, but not as blustery, not as gusty as yesterday. We should see some decent spells of sunshine over parts of North Wales 
Wales, uh, Northern England and southwest Scotland. Temperatures still struggling a little bit, feeling fresh in that breeze, but generally with a bit more sunshine, the wind's a little lighter than yesterday. It does feel a little warmer, or it certainly will do by this afternoon. Going to turn quite chilly overnight, though. More showers packing in across northern Scotland with a, a gusty wind blowing here. We'll see a fair few showers drifting across northern England and Wales through the night. They'll crop up across parts of the south during the early hours. It will be a, a chilly old night, though. Four or five in towns and cities, lower across parts of northern England, southern Scotland. A hint of blue on the chart. Some rural spots could easily start below freezing uh, tomorrow morning. So again, a chilly start. For many, quite a sunny start tomorrow. Main exception to that will be Northern Ireland. Cloud moving in here, uh, a dull, damp day, and some of that rain will spread to southwest Scotland, North Wales later on. Sprinkling of showers over parts of the east, but again, many places dodging the showers dry and bright, but again, for most, on the cool side. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. latest GB News Travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. On the M1 in West Yorkshire, there are two lanes closed southbound where a car's overturned at Junction 46 near Leeds, causing queues. On the M60 in Greater Manchester, there are four out of five lanes closed anti-clockwise after an accident between Junctions 19 and 18 from Eaton Park to Sinister Island. It's just the outside lane that's open past the scene, causing long delays. On the M6 in Warwickshire, the southbound exit at Junction 3, the commentary and uneaten turns closed for emergency barrier repairs. On the M25 in Essex, it's taking 40 minutes anti-clockwise from Junction 28 for the A12 to 25 for the 810 after an accident earlier. Also in Essex, the A13 is partly blocked westbound at the Sadler's Farm roundabout at South Benfleet, causing delays. And on the M25 in Kent, there's a lane closed clockwise after an accident halfway between junctions two and three from the A2 to the M20. Swanley interchange causing queues. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Very good morning, it's 10 o'clock on Tuesday the 16th of April. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with me, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. Muslim prayer ban ruling. Any moment now, the Michaela Trust School in London will find out if a Muslim student has won a challenge against its ban on prayer rituals. This is the school run by Britain's top head teacher, uh, Catherine Burblesing, and this could have huge implications for the entire country, so stay tuned. Uh, the Culture Secretary, Lucy Fraser, has called on sporting chiefs to ban transgender athletes. The former Olympic swimmer, Sharon Davis, joins us about that next.
We love this. A new study claims that going vegan is not exactly always going to be better for your health. It says plant-based meat products are full of salt and fat. I'm sticking to my bacon sandwiches. Thank you. And GB News presenter Nigel Farage is at the National Conservatism Conference in Brussels this morning. We're going to be dipping into his speech when he takes to the stage. And um, there is discussions afoot that teenagers who, or actually just first-time drivers, they don't yeah. need to be teenagers, who pass their test shouldn't be able, able to take passengers for six months after they pass their test. We're going to be talking to one bereaved mother whose son died, if you remember, in that awful tragedy in Snowdonia in November, where four teens went off the road in a car to hear why she thinks it's a good idea. First, though, very latest news with Tatiana Sanchez. Bev, thank you and good morning. The top stories. The Prime Minister is expected to urge Benjamin Netanyahu to show restraint in his response to Iran's missile and drone attack. Rishi Sunak is among world leaders warning the Israeli Prime Minister to avoid escalation in the Middle East amid concerns the crisis could spiral out of control. Reports suggest Israeli forces have paused their planned ground offensive in Rafah to focus on their response against Iran. The United Nations claims it's concerned about the possibility that nuclear facilities could be targeted in a revenge attack. However, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi says even the smallest action against Iran will be met with a severe, widespread and painful response. The government's flagship Rwanda bill heads back to the House of Lords today after MPs rejected a series of amendments peers made to the legislation. Eyes to the right, 315. The nose to the left, 215. The Lords had raised a number of concerns, including allowing individual asylum appeals based on safety. However, after a debate in the Commons last night, MPs dismissed all changes, with some Conservatives calling the proposed changes ridiculous. Downing Street's hoping to clear the final hurdle this week and get flights off the ground within weeks, but Labour insists the scheme is doomed to fail. The Prime Minister is facing the prospect of a rebellion as his plan to stop young people smoking is brought before the Commons for the first time today. If the tobacco and vapes bill becomes law, it would be an offence to sell tobacco products to anyone born after the 1st of January 2009. It means children aged 15 or younger today will never legally be able to buy a cigarette. However, the bill would only make the sale of tobacco products illegal, not the act of smoking. The rate of unemployment in the UK has risen by more than expected and growth in earnings has eased back again. The Office for National Statistics says unemployment increased to 4.2% in the three months to February, the highest rate for six months. Regular wages, excluding bonuses, grew by 6% in the same period from 6.1% in the previous three months. It'll soon be an offence to create a sexually explicit deep fake image without consent with those convicted facing a criminal record and an unlimited fine. Under the new legislation, people in England and Wales could even face jail time if the image is shared more widely. Creating a deep fake will be an offence irrespective of whether the person who made it intended to share it or not. The new law will be introduced through an amendment to the controversial Criminal Justice Bill, which is still making its way through Parliament. Victims and Safeguarding Minister Laura Farris told GB News deep fake technology can have catastrophic consequences. It's an offence in this country to create an explosive device, even if you're doing so privately in your kitchen. Uh, but we do it because if it falls into the wrong hands or if motive changes, it could cause catastrophic harm. And in a psychological sense, creating a grossly offensive, explicit video where you're using a real person's, you know, face and you're superimposing that and you're making it look incredibly realistic can cause actually catastrophic psychological harm. The Labour Party has promised to protect family finances after a reported spike in repossessed homes after the mini-budget. The party's new analysis shows the number of families at risk of losing their home jumped 46% as a result of Liz Truss's mini-budget and soaring mortgages. 
More than 16,500 repossession claims were made last year, up from just over 11,300 in the previous year. Chair of the Labour Party, Annalise Dodds, told GB News the government's not doing enough to help families. Nick certainly hasn't learned the lessons of that Liz Truss period because, of course, he's put forward a huge unfunded tax cut, £46 billion, pounds, not said how he would pay for that or whether he'd be putting up taxes elsewhere to pay for it or slashing public services. So certainly the Conservative Party's got to do a lot more to learn from the impact, the awful impact of that Liz Truss period, particularly on family finances. And Scottish Power will refund £1.5 million to customers after overcharging during the height of the energy crisis. The firm's admitted to charging almost 1,700 direct debit customers above the price cap between 2015 and 2023. The regulator Ofgem says Scottish Power will pay an average of £294 back to each customer affected. All payments will be made automatically. Customers do not need to do anything. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Andrew and Bev. Well, the time is now 10.06. You're with Britain's News with GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. So, Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser has urged sporting chiefs to ban transgender athletes from elite women's sporting events. Uh, she said those sporting bodies have a duty to set out clear guidance as biology matters and male-born athletes have, clearly, an indisputable edge. <laughs> Do you know, sometimes you feel like you're saying things which you should be... Uh, we should just have a thing on, underneath that says blindingly obvious. Yeah. Well, joining but... us now is Olympic swimmer and medalist Sharon Davis. Good morning, Sharon. I mean, you've been Good fighting... Morning. You've been fighting this fight for probably more than 10 years now and you just must still feel we should just put the strap underneath saying the blindingly obvious. But at least Lucy Fraser has come out and said something now. Yeah, good morning to you both. It's funny, isn't it? Because when I spoke to you last, last, you know, last week, I was on my way to see Lucy Fraser. So that's where yeah. I was going down to Westminster, um, because there was a meeting with quite a few of the uh, the governing bodies, including the FA and the ECB, on Monday. And surprise, surprise, they didn't want me there because I will point out to them that they're talking rubbish whenever they bring up these ridiculous, you know, T levels, reduce it for a year, reduce it to half what women get, twice what men get, whatever. It's all absolute garbage. We know that males and females are, are physically very different. And that's the reason why we have that category in sport. So Lucy is doing a great thing. Um, what we need to do, though, is to bring consequences in because this is sex discrimination. We are discriminating against people that are biologically female in sport. So removing funding, I think, is the next step that we actually have to do. And the other thing that's really important is to not limit it to elite sports. You know, mm. little girls in school matter just mm. as much. Yeah. We need pathways for those athletes to come through. To say one group of women are worthy of fair sport and another group are not is, is ridiculous. And, and Sharon, just clarify, when you said they didn't want you there, did you mean the cricket and football bodies? Because, of course, they have done nothing at all about um, uh, e what they don't want to... They refuse to do so far what Lucy Fraser is urging the rest to do. Yeah, and the ECB are even going against the International Federation because they have actually protected the female category. So what we're finding is that when we have a, Le a Leah Thomas in, in a sport, the sport will turn around and do the blindingly obvious because then they can't ignore it any longer. And that's what's happening, you know, is that uh, sports where they don't at the moment have someone like Leah Thomas, they're just hoping it's going to happen to somebody else and somebody else will sort the problem out. But this has been going on now since 2015 when the IOC changed the rules and the government have been given guidance guidance to governing bodies now since 2024 years. So it's time to stop giving guidance and to give instruction and for there to be consequences to it. Mm. Well, that's the point. It's just guidance, isn't it, Sharon? And um, and, and time is everything. They, if they wanted legislation, they might struggle to get the Labour Party to support it when Keir Starmer was struggling to say whether a woman can have a penis or not, the Labour leader. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are seeing that sign of, you know, slightly changing, haven't we? We've seen West Streeting this week, you know, to, to eat some humble pie and to reverse. And, and to credit to him, you know, it is about people saying, look, I was wrong. What frustrates me is that all this evidence has been there for a very long time. You know, this isn't something which all of a sudden has just arrived in the last couple of weeks. This mm. has been around for a long time and it's been ignored by so many people in positions of authorities who should have done their proper homework and not just followed fashionable ideology 
And to throw women's sport the way that they have done under the bus, you know, the bus for, since 2015, without even looking at the science. And the science has never changed. There's never been a single study that shows us that we can remove male puberty advantage. And every Olympics ever in history shows us the difference between males and females. To just chuck women's sport away was was awful, you know, and, and so misogynistic. And now in those very misogynistic sports like cricket and football, tennis, golf, we're, we're literally still banging our heads against a brick wall. Um, and and so you have the, to ask, why is this? And so the people, Sharon, who have fought to have transgender women in those competitions, their argument is what? Their argument is gender is a cultural construct. It isn't what you are born into. It is something we decide that I wear dresses and that Andrew wears a suit. Most of the time. And therefore, <laughs> I and wear a suit sometimes, though. <laughs> you know, it's it is crazy. That's, that it's... That, but that's but that's the cultural. And therefore, they would say, as somebody wearing a sw one piece swimsuit as opposed to a little pair of speedos, yeah. they should be allowed to race in that race, and that they've taken sufficient hormones to reduce their testosterone. Therefore, they're no longer a threat. Well, in lots of sports, they don't even do that. And the levels that they reduce it to, it's it's so ridiculous and, and you know, not it's not even checked up on. So uh, some sports, it'll be five nanomoles, some it's 10 nanomoles, some it's 2.5 nanomoles, mm. some it's one year, some it's five years. And there's no testing system in place to make sure they're doing this. And also women are under one nanomole of testosterone per liter mm. of blood. So even reducing it to two and a half, you still got two and a half times once you've gone through male puberty, but in fact, you know, women have a different Q angle. So, for example, in football, women have six times as many ACL injuries, that's knee injuries, because our Q angle is bigger because we have childbearing hips. Mm. So that also sort of extrapolates to power that you can put through a stride on a bike, for example, you know, the power that you can get. So none of these things can be changed by reducing your testosterone. So what we need to do is we need to sensibly relabel the categories, female, meaning biological female, and then open and inclusive. And I will reiterate what I've said all along. I don't want anyone to be banned from sport. I don't want anyone not to be encouraged to do sport. It's really important we do sport. But it needs to be fair and, it, you know, inclusive can be in an open category and so, wear what you like in that category. Call yourself whatever you like and be safe, but compete fairly. But then I am baffled because it is so logical. It is so rational. It just seems so fair when we describe it in these terms. So what are the pressures being placed upon the Football Association and the English Cricket Board? Bokery. Who are they trying to please, Sharon? a very small group of men's feelings versus 51% of the world's population that are females um, <laughs> who just don't seem to matter, basically. And what's really fascinating is, you know, you talked about swimwear. Um, at the NC2As, which is the college championships in America, when Leo Thomas was competing, we had transgender men, that is biological females, identifying as men and competing with the women. And the women had no problem. So providing they were non-testosterone, which is illegal, as we know, and would cause you a, a four-year ban, women have no problem with how mm. anyone identifies Identifies, providing they're racing other females. Um, and so Sharon, that should also apply to men. I hate to interrupt you, but your timing on this show this morning could not be better, and this is coincidental. I know, I'm looking watching, at it. <laughs> we just have to explain to people who are going, what are those pictures? They, they don't look transgender. This is the lighting of the Olympic flame. Yes. Of course, it is Olympic year. These are beautiful images. Just remind us, Sharon, yeah. of your first Olympic experience oh. and how important that was. When was it even? And that was a 13-year-old, you know? That was way back in 1976. Okay. One of these youngsters that was on a pathway that wouldn't have got there if we don't protect pathways. Um, and Paris will be my 13th Olympic Games. Nice. So, yes, I will be there in Paris with my microphone on the side of the pool. Extremely excited about that. Um, you know, they are an incredible competition. Uh, we were talking, weren't we, about money, you know, and Seb bringing money into track and field uh, on, on Thursday. Um, the, uh, the IOC makes a fortune out of being able to control the IOC and not really passing on any of that to, to the athletes themselves. It's an incredible event, but it does need to change. Uh, the IOC needs to be way more transparent, and a lot of this problem in sport has been caused by them. You know, it really has. And they're still funding incredibly bogus, unscientific studies um, to try and support their position that there's no biological difference between them, men and female. And if that was the case, we wouldn't have men and female races. So they right. know that's not true. You maybe know, it, it is just crazy. Maybe there should be a trans category, Sharon. 
Yeah, except for we tried that in World Aquatics. So in yeah. October of last year, we had the first um, trans uh, category and not a single trans athlete turned up. Funny that. This isn't, <laughs> funny that. This isn't about them, yeah, funny that, isn't it? This isn't about them wanting to be included. This is about them wanting an advantage in women's sport. Oh, of course it is. Mm. Of course it is. These pictures are giving me goosebumps, Sharon. I don't know how, how clearly you can see them. From there, I wish I, it's a some mistake. I wish we had the audio because it looks like this lady is is um, chanting. Is she singing or is she talking? She I honestly don't know. But I, ha I have to say, I did love the Olympic Games in Athens. Do you remember all the hassle? And they were saying it wasn't going to be ready, That's and, right. and yes, that was right. wasn't yeah. sorted out. And the hotels weren't built, and yet it was an absolutely fantastic Olympic Games because we could see the Acropolis, and it was a celebration of yeah, the hundred years modern Olympic Games. And you know, I, I have to say, each Olympics is is really special in its own right. But for me. My first ones will always be special. Mm. I think Athens will always be special. And London, you know, was mm. just, we did a marvellous job. We did a really fabulous job, yeah. And I'm quite excited to hear that Glasgow might be having the Commonwealth Games because we nearly, we nearly lost them. Now, so, just, uh, just remind us, because that's the Commonwealth Games which ha couldn't go ahead because of funding issues, am I right? Yeah, and I think a, li a little bit of this is because we're turning these major events into such a massive circus, and it's not necessary. You know, we spent so much money on Birmingham, the Commonwealth Games, and it was incredible. But the money that was used to build brand new facilities, that was built to you know build new facilities mm. to to house the athletes in, not necessary. Use facilities that we have. Use student accommodation. Providing athletes have got a good bed and good food, what they need then is a good track and a good pool, but they don't need a brand new one. They just yeah. need a good one. So yeah, we could absolutely. run these events much, much cheaper and then we won't lose them. Yeah, OK. Sharon, this absolute beacon of common sense always and is. brilliance, as always. It's so lovely to see you. Uh, thank you thank so you much, too. Sharon. I'm just You're sorry right. that you have to go to the Olympics with the BBC. Um, <laughs> that's the only thing I feel sorry for you for. I'm joking. Sign her up. Sign um, her up. Right, we're just going to just gonna take a little bit of this footage because this is so beautiful. Look how traditional this is. Women yeah. in Greece. Um, it's the Olympic in Olympia, in, the Olympic light flame in, lighting ceremony. In tradition, if you're listening on the radio, they're in traditional costume. Uh, the flame is being lit. Uh, it is the countdown now to the Olympic Games, which of course are in Paris uh, in July and August. That's right, 101 days. Yeah. Until the Olympics start, um, I went to watch in London. In, yeah. the, in the arena. Were you there for the London uh, for Olympics? For bits of it, yeah. And uh, do you know what was one of the most really exciting moments? I didn't think it would be. I saw the Olympic flame and yeah. I was in a car and I made the car start. So I wanted just to see it and I wanted to touch it as they ran past it. And it was quite moving. We have one. I have yeah. one of the Olympic torches because yeah. my ex-husband won a couple of gold medals and, in fact, one of them was in Athens at the yeah. Olympics that Sharon was talking about in uh, the Coxus 4 boat at the time with Matt Pinson and then he won in Sydney uh, with Steve, Red Steve Redgrave in 2000. Um, and so for or what Olympics must it have been? I don't think it was London. Maybe it was. James got to run with the Olympic torch. It would have been London. It would have been London, would have been London sure. wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah. It feels like yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. Um, and he got to run with the Olympic flame for a little bit of that journey, and Very therefore moving. he has the, um, the actual moving. flame. Very moving. I just felt it meant, uh, in some small way, I was part of it because they were on their way mm. to, to the stadium. East. And look how it transformed the East, that part of London, which I used to live in many years ago. Fantastic. It's fantastic. But as, as Sharon says, they. The, the important thing with these facilities, particularly when they get built new, is that they have a longevity yeah. to them. Because wasn't it the track and field stadium that we built for London is no longer a track and field stadium, I think. It's, I might be wrong a, it's, on that. It's a, it's a football stadium, isn't it, no? Well, the football stadium did stay in existence. The swimming pool largely stayed in existence, yeah. but I don't think it has necessarily the best but, team. But the accommodation was all utilised. That's right, yep, yep. Some of it, I think, what was a good legacy from the Olympics. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're looking at these live pictures here. And, of course, Olympic we had that plane. debate here with Sharon Davis about should they be paid at uh, Olympians? And mm. it's been raging all the letters pages of the National newspapers all week people are very split half and half I, yeah. I thought I'd be outraged by it but Sharon Davis made a very good case for why they should be paid didn't she she did she actually said that she thought that they should be athletes because of course you a lot of the athletes at the Olympics are in amateur sports they yeah. don't have massive sponsorship deals and then we spoke of course to Sir Steve Redgrave after yeah, yeah. Sharon and Steve said he thought that it was wrong that it was the athletes it's track and well, field who were getting the 40,000 yeah, pounds the, because he says they already have massive he made the point when he returned from Atlanta where he won gold 
He was in the red. He was, he was in, in the red. And in Atlanta, they were the only gold medal that Great Britain got yeah. in Atlanta. And he, and he came back... ..with Steve and Matt. ..with, with debts. In a, in a Cotsis pair. So, um, I, I'm now converted, I think, perhaps. Yeah. But, but typically, the, the money is going to the Blue Ribbon events, track and field, where a lot of the glamour is and where a lot of the money is already. That's right. Right, still to come this morning, Prince Harry has lost the initial attempt to appeal against the security ruling. We're going to be discussing that next. This Poor Harry. Britain's newsroom on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday stories like Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland now come with a trigger warning at universities. Universities alerting readers to possible themes of white supremacy. Yes, quote, these unquote. warnings are being applied to Quo, what, colonial narratives, that's, that's the claim, commonly found in adventure stories and famous novels from the uh, Victorian era. Well, joining us now is the actor Charlie Lawson. And, and Charlie, um, these warnings have been applied to Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland. I, I, what's, what's this university getting at? Well, look, first of all, this isn't um, this is nothing new. Um, uh, we hadn't heard about it for a while. Universities have been doing this over the last couple of years. I remember having a chat with one of your colleagues. But when Gabriella, the lovely Gabby, phoned me up today, I, I had to beg her to put me on after nine o'clock because I, I found myself... <laughs> getting rather irate about the whole thing. But I will do my best to be very polite. Uh, yes, keep it clean. Said. Yes, look, which is quite difficult for me, as you'll appreciate over this subject. Look, this is universities just jumping on the same, relative, you know, trying to be relative, relevant bandwagon. Uh, you know, is it any wonder that um, you, we look at the quality of... Um, graduates from university, and, and in my humble opinion, um, some of them are slightly disappointing. But I did phone a couple of people I knew who had sons and daughters at various leading universities, and they had been speaking this morning. And thank the Lord, they think it's a complete load of bloody nonsense, as I do. Give the C.S. Lewis Centre a ring in East Belfast, because that's where your man came from. And I think you'll find you'll get short shrift because we're not all about that in East Belfast. We don't censor anything. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and, of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's 10.24, you with Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Are you busy, Andrew? Yeah, well, Nigel, uh, Nigel was just talking <laughs> about BAT shop. on bras. I said, don't look at me, I'm not an expert on bras. <laughs> that, we can definitely conclude, is true. You are definitely no expert on bras. <laughs> uh, right, we're joined now by um, uh, Colvier Ranger, Lord Colvier Ranger, and GB News' senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson. Right, Colvier, let's start with this story about... Um, this is the widow of murdered Gary Newlove, Baroness Newlove, who wants the Victims and Prisoners Bill being debate, debated today to support victims. Why? What is, what is she arguing for? Well, I think we're, we're all concerned when we see an increasing spike in antisocial behaviour, but mm. sometimes it feels like antisocial behaviour can be just not ignored by the police, but not given the priority it deserves. And it's a real nuisance. Mm. We all know that we can see things that escalate and in certain cases, as in this one, where they get completely out of hand and obviously yeah. end in tragedy. But what Baroness Newlove is talking about here is the support for victims, because this is something that can go on for a very long time. 
have significant consequences and the support doesn't quite seem to be there, the amount of support that they yeah. want. So when you have this kind of issue, can there be some inclusion in this mm -hmm. bill to ensure that the support services are unlocked for the victims appropriately yeah. and quickly, because that's the key. And she's saying if, if after the third time you've had an incident of anti-social behaviour, that's when the police have to respond, because we know sometimes there can be dozens of incidents of anti-social yeah. behaviour and the police don't respond. So I she's think saying it should be three, this and is, I think that's not this a bad is the other point, cut off. Uh, uh, Andrew, because you've got A, support for the victims, B, uh, where is the prioritisation for the police? Now, this yeah. is a very difficult conversation because yeah. as soon as you start stepping into we want the police to prioritise yeah, yeah. this or is it knife crime or is it homicide? I've had these conversations before when I worked at City Hall and I'd be in the room when you've had the commissioner in and, you know, we'd be saying we really want this sorted out and the police would be saying, well, what about all these other things? Where is the priority yeah. line? So putting numbers on things I think mm. is a bit tricky because sure. it depends on the impact of the actual behaviour. If mm. it's say, noise pollution or some kids being rowdy on the street, three occurrences may not be the right point to trigger it. But if there's something more violent going on, if there's something more intimidatory, then we really need to... Yeah. So I think you've got to get the police to focus on the issue, sometimes maybe just one incident that triggers yeah. the response. I mean, rather than it's a really... I think so, anti-social behaviour is a really big issue, actually, Nigel. Yeah, it affects so many people, yeah. yeah. And people may think, oh, it's not very serious, but if it is constant noise outside your front door, if it is a gang of lads who are yeah. uh, terrorising somebody, I mean, that's a real problem. And I, I do think Taking that... Cars. Where I disagree with, with Colvier is I think you should actually put a, a figure on it. I mean, right. I mean, what she's actually suggesting is if it happens three times, yes. um, you will get victim support, so that will immediately click in. The police will then take it more seriously because, obviously, it's, it's then a constant. And it seems to be if you don't set some kind of um, benchmark for when you get intervention, it just won't happen. Yeah. So, on the basis of that, I don't think think three times outside your own home, especially considering what happened to her husband... Yeah, he was kicked to death. He was kicked to death out, like outside... who were vandalising his car. That's right. Kicked to death in front of his own um, daughters. And, obviously, the thing about antisocial behaviour is it can escalate anyway. So, on the basis of that, I think that what she's suggesting makes sense. It's not too onerous. I take the point about where do police sort of prioritise things, but when something like this happens, um, I do think that they need to intervene. Mm. You talk to some police, they say they spend far too much time acting as social workers yeah. and far too much time on computer screens looking for so-called hate crimes. Yes. And Because what we really want them is out in the community, Colbert. Well, it's the bobbies on the beat. Yeah. You know, we've heard it many times. It's a cliche, it's but been used people want it. The visibility yes. of the police on the street, sometimes that's enough to stop this kind of activity mm. happening anyway. If people know... Yeah. It, it's whenever you see a police car driving along. Have you noticed how the traffic suddenly behaves a lot better? Yeah. <laughs> Slows down. Yeah. Yes. Now, if you saw a policeman or woman or, you know, officer mm. on the beat, you, you just have that notice and you feel a bit safer as well. Yeah. Uh, I don't know when I last I saw... Officers but just casually never, walking along. I just never. wonder what... I, I, and I love the police. I don't, don't mean this to sound as derogatory as it's going to sound, but we have appalling rape conviction rates. Terrible. House burglary there was something about 100% of house burglaries were not mm. solved in yeah. various... There's a story in The Sun today, 70% of car thefts, they don't even That's bother right. to That's right, so they're to, not doing burglary, attend. they're not solving car theft. Um... What are they doing? And the Metropolitan Nigel. Police Commission said every burglary would be investigated. Yes. He can't deliver on that. Uh, but no, because there are so many of them. Yeah. Shoplifting um, is. And obviously, that yeah. there is no deterrent value. If you don't no. actually solve the things, you can't yeah. deter future yeah. ones, and all that happens is they yeah. just increase. Yeah, and we've been talked mm. a lot on this programme about shoplifting. If you get the co op is having a particularly bad time, mm. and unless 200 quid's worth is nicked, they're not interested. To yeah. Us. So again, that you you've got to actually deal with it, deal with yeah. it uh, right from the start. I mean, I was in the in uh, my local supermarket, and suddenly a, a fight broke out. Actually, it was all staged, so a gang could come in and whip stuff off the shelves. Yeah. I didn't see a policeman turn up after that at all. I, th no. I think we do have to listen to the forces and understand where is their time going. Because they know where they're having to use their time behind desks, filling out forms, all the processes and everything else, mm. and say, what can we do to help them to get more visible policing? Yeah. I mean, it, it is the old adage, Bobby's on the beat, but yeah. more visible policing helps in all of these things. Yeah. Um, right, let's talk about Prince Harry. Yes. It's a little bit complicated, <laughs> this, Nigel, because he <laughs> no took fan, action yeah. against the Home Office, didn't he, after a decision to not allow him to have royal, effectively armed protection when he's in the UK. Yep. He lost that case, he's appealed, 
And he's lost again. What does he do now? Well, he's been given leave to appeal uh, appeal again to, to, uh, for all this. I mean, the um, judge was devastating about his case, saying it was pathetic. Yes, yes, but, he, but, he but, still, but still says that he can actually have another appeal. Well, um, I mean, the issue here is that... Um, Every, every public figure, whoever it might be, they're assessed about the risk to their, um, uh, to their life. Mm. So what happens in, in, in Prince Harry's case, if he's over in Britain, there will be an assessment to say whether he's in danger or not. Um, if he's not, then, the, then the, amount, the amount of protection goes down uh, commensurate to the risk you face. I mean, look at someone like Salman Rushdie. Yeah. He, he was somebody who uh, a fatwa was issued against him. He had close protection for a long time, that began to disappear, and now look what's happened. He's yeah, lost, an, lost eye, an eye, been stabbed, that kind of thing. So if Salman Rushdie ever came back here to Britain, he would then get a level of protection mm. which he deserves yeah. to have. Should he yeah. have, just briefly, Colbert? I will forever have a soft spot for Prince Harry, and I think we have a duty to keep him safe when he's in Britain. Mm. But if so he's on public good. duties, he will be kept safe, Colby. It's the level of protection he'll he'll need. And as, as Nigel says, it depends also on the level of threat there is. And at the moment, we know there's a high level of threat. So as long as we say we have the right level of protection, like him say, what would happen, Andrew, if something did happen to mm. him it, it, while he was yeah. here? So yeah. let's think of it that way. Yeah. OK, we need to move on, gentlemen. Thank you so much for, uh, for now. Uh, Tatiana Sanchez has your news headlines. Beth, thank you. The top stories this hour. Rishi Sunak is due to speak to Benjamin Netanyahu later about a de-escalation of hostilities with Iran amid concerns the crisis could spiral out of control. Despite continued calls for restraint from across the world, Israel has vowed to retaliate against Iran's major missile and drone attack over the weekend. Reports suggest Israeli forces have paused their planned ground offensive in Rafah to focus on their response against Tehran. However, Iranian President and Ebrahim Raisi says even the smallest action against Iran will be met with a severe, widespread and painful response. Rishi Sunak could face a rebellion over his proposals to make it an offence to sell tobacco products to anyone born after the 1st of January 2009. Plans to stop young people in England from ever smoking are being debated in the Commons later for the first time. Should the tobacco and vapes bill be passed into law, children aged 15 or younger today will never legally be able to buy a cigarette. The bill would make the sale of tobacco products rather than the act of smoking illegal. The rate of unemployment in the UK has risen by more than expected and growth in earnings has eased back again. The ONS says unemployment increased to 4.2% in the three months to February, the highest rate for six months. Regular wages, excluding bonuses, grew by 6% in the same period, from 6.1% in the previous three months. And in Greece, the Olympic flame has been lit, marking the final stretch of the preparations for the Games set to start on the 26th of July. If you're watching on TV, these are the live scenes from the traditional ceremony taking place in ancient Olympia before the torch relay begins. For the first time since the COVID pandemic, spectators are able to attend that torch relay events. Greece's 2020 rowing champion Stefanos Tukos will be the first relay runner. This year's Summer Games get underway in Paris in 101 days' time. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2444 and 1.1708 euros. The price of gold is £1,904.49 per ounce and the FTSE 100 <laughs> sorry, at 7,859 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Very good morning. Remember, we're waiting for that ruling on the Catherine Burble Singh Britain's strictest head school as to whether that headmistress is 
compelled to provide and a ritualistic we, prayer space at lunchtime. And we are rooting for her. We don't want, we want her to win. We're also going to be joined by Crystal Owen. She is now a road safety campaigner after her son Harvey uh, died in a car crash in November. She's going to be in the studio with us and we're talking about whether young drivers should be allowed to carry passengers. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding on the M6 in Warwickshire, the South Med exit at Junction 3. The Coventry and Uneaton turns closed for emergency barrier repairs. Train services are suspended westbound from Ely to Peterborough because of a faulty train at Mainy. The M4 in Bridgend is partly blocked eastbound between junctions 36 and 35 from Sun to Pencoid, causing queues. In Essex, the A13 is partly blocked westbound at the Saddler's Farm roundabout at South Benfleet, causing delays. In Kent, the A249 is closed southbound along Detling Hill towards junction 7 of the M20 near Maidstone for emergency repairs after a lorry ruptured its fuel tank yesterday morning. And in Devon, the A380 is closed in both directions between Sandygate and King Stainton because of an accident causing queues. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight and the following morning, 5 till 6am on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. This will be a very special interview because joining us in the studio is Chris Lowe. Now, she's a road safety campaigner whose son Harvey was only 17 when he died alongside his friends in their crash car in Snowdonia in November. There's a move now to, for amongst, to change the law to stop newly qualified drivers, especially teenagers, mm. from having passengers in the car. Mm. Crystal's with us now. Crystal, um, lovely for you to be with us and very brave of you to talk to us because this must still be incredibly raw. Yeah, and I, I find it sad that bereaved parents have to do this and that I have to be here so soon. It's sad that we have to fight this cause that has been talked about for so many years and that's why I'm doing it now. Just a couple of days ago, there were three lads killed in a car crash, Staples Corner in, in West London, mm. no other car involved. Yeah, it happens when you're actually aware of it and you zone into it, it's actually every few days. I know that in the few weeks that Harvey and his friends died, I actually counted 11 young people. Mm. So. And I know you still have to be a little delicate around the events because mm. the inquest is, is still going on, but if you could just take us back to, to that day a little bit and Harvey getting in the mm. car as a passenger. Yeah, so um, Harvey was going away on a weekend with friends, which um, first weekend away, um, he not long turned 17. Obviously, try and give him a bit of freedom. I had some um, proof of where he was going the first evening. 
Um, he told me the dad was driving. I had no reason to doubt this because we knew all his friends, or so we thought. Um, and he, Harvey wasn't even mm. even interested in driving at the time. So um, I let him go, thinking he was being driven there by a responsible adult. And it turns out this wasn't the case. It was a young driver. So after the first night staying where he said he was, mm. seeing evidence of where he was, yeah. um, they then set off for, for a camping trip. And it was on a rural road um, on a bend and four boys in a car. So they're four times more likely to crash with passengers. One in five drivers crash in the new year. And rural roads are actually 72% more likely to crash. So, yeah. Mm. And how experienced was the driver? How long had he had his licence for? Um, I can't talk about anything like that at the okay. moment because he invests. Okay. But he, he was a, new, a, a novice new driver, driver, yeah. So. Uh, so, for you, so there is this talk now, Chris, about changing the law. How imperative is it? It's crucial. It's it's literally a, a, a national emergency at the moment. Like it, it's been talked about for so long, and yet nothing's been done. And it's the leading cause of killer of a killer of um, death in young people, and the leading cause of death in in it's people ironic because worldwide. The government today having a big vote in the comment mm. about smoking. They talk yeah. the government wants to stop stop fifteen year olds being ever to fifteen yeah. now ever being able to buy fags. Noble ambition, but they could save a lot more lives if yeah. they intervened. Yeah, well, and this law, what got me talking so soon was the day after I actually heard that, because I, I thought it was madness when I thought of it, that actually, like, a young driver can fill a car with passengers so early on, and um, when we know there's, like, so inexperienced and young, which is two factors that obviously go against them. So um, then when I heard that it was in Australia, I was, like, so shocked that we hadn't even looked into it. And then I was even more shocked, thinking, well, actually, no, this is in so many other countries, and in every single country it's been implemented. It has worked and it's proven to save lives between 20 and 40%. Mm. So it's... And, and it would save the economy £200 million a year around that mark. It would um, put less pressure on the mm. NHS. Um, it would save a lot of grieving families. Yeah, this is it, and it's the... You know, it's people say it's restrictive. Yet, yeah, how restrictive? You know, you, you, if you lose your life, how much more restrictive right. can you get? And, and what you're arguing for is, is a six-month period of time as well, a new driver or more? Well, on the petition, we actually put 12 months, just because from the research, um, like we say, with the one in five uh, new learners um, passing, mm. sorry, crashing in the first year, that's that's where we've got the evidence from and what we've put on the petition, but. Um, we just want it to talk about, really. Like, we, you know, even if government met us like halfway and included some elements of the graduated licence, it would save lives. So the age range, we've, we've put up to 25, and that's only for the first... Like I say, it's not up until the age of yeah. 25. It's, it's people under that age, and there's lots of science behind that, why that's, why that's the and age. And that's because boys' brains, particularly yeah. boys, it actually... It is boys. Yeah. But yeah. their yeah. brains don't develop no. until they're 25. So in terms of a risk assessment or yeah. impulse control... Yeah. So people say, oh, well, I'm an adult of that age, it's not fair, we can buy alcohol. You can buy alcohol, but you can't kill anybody with that alcohol. Like, you're literally behind the wheel of a lethal weapon, and that's the thing. And it's, it's, it's actually, like, people say about the economy and so and so, it would actually, like, enable young people to, to drive more. Like, it would actually would help with insurance, the cost of insurance. Like, at the moment, that's... Yeah. that's I mean, a young man behind the wheel point. of a car is more, is more lethal than a young man wielding mm. a knife exactly, in yeah. a crowded street. Exactly. It kills more people yeah. than knife crime. Tell us about Harvey. Was he was... About? Honestly, just... The, I know everyone says that about the child, but he was an absolutely gorgeous boy. He, he was just so kind. He would do anything for anyone. He... He was like an old soul, so he loved all his, like, Jerry Rafferty, the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix. He'd spend hours on his guitar. He was usually always at home. If he, he was either at work, college, or at the gym recently, but um, always so at home. Was, what was he studying? What was he hoping to be? He was doing A-levels. He, right. he, he, he did want to do hospitality, but right. um, he didn't want to do the waiting on part of it, so he was, his dreams for the future to open an Italian-themed restaurant and sell breads. He also worked at a, a local pizza shop. And it must be conflicting emotions for you, particularly in the immediate aftermath, because I have a son that's only just turned 20, and they are a law unto themselves, mm -hmm. and there's only so much you can do to yeah. control their decision-making yeah. process. Yeah. Um, and I can't imagine what that must have been like to get the call, because you're kind of furious with them as well for making that choice. I am. Well, I, I, I was and I wasn't. I, I knew in that, that in he they weren't doing anything wrong, you know, yeah. that's the thing, and I think, like... I, I've got 101 texts on my phone to Harvey, like, every day, what time are you back from work? Have you got your earphones out? You know, yeah. he your helmet on? Yeah. Because no matter how much I told him, every time I caught him on his bike, he'd, he'd not have his helmet on. And you just couldn't get it through to him, you know. He's and a boy. He, he came off his bike and he'd say, oh, I've been cycling for years, but oh, they just... 
couldn't, you can't get through. Now what I've learned more about the science of the brain, I understand why, and it's not yeah. just, you know, it's easy as a parent to get frustrated, but actually it's not their fault. And, and this is what we're saying with the with the driver, it's just trying to protect them. So they're, they're young, so the, the science is against them, but also they're inexperienced, so them two things together. Mm. It's just about protecting them, protecting their passengers and protecting everybody else. M ministers need to listen to people yeah. like you because this is a terrible tragedy that's been acted yeah. out in homes every week. Yeah, they also need to le listen to the top behavioural experts yes. and the the research from other countries, um, all the evidence is in favour of this. The RAC have recently done a, a research into the impact on work and employment, all the, all the things that people think. Um, there's exemptions in other countries, so young parents could take their own children. What can people do to help you, Crystal? They can sign the petition, so the easy way to find it is Young Driver Petition. It's actually a petition for a mm. progressive driving licence, but Young Driver Petition, they can sign that. Um, you speak to your children. Um, yeah. And this isn't always enough, unfortunately, and that's what we know. We've got people in, we've set up a Forget Me Family Not Families Not Uniting group, um, and this is for brief parents who've all lost children due to this law not being in place. Mm. And we've got young people in that group that were spoken to about after Harvey's crash and still went on to crash. Did they really? Just due to, due to inexperience, yeah. carful, nothing, you know, not, they're not to blame. Mm. Yeah, if this is going to make you want to wrap your... You've got three other children, mm. maybe one of them's 20, yeah. your daughter, you're going to want to wrap them even more in cotton wool, aren't mm. you? Well, this is why I'm doing it now, because I do not want this to be still debated in years to come. It, it frustrated me so much, and I've only been doing this a short time. And for the other families, we've got, we've got a couple in our group who've been campaigning for 40 years. Oh, no. And, and, and why? Like, why are we having to put ourselves through this? 40 and years. When you really delve into it, like I say, it's, it's just the most frustrating thing ever. And it's so obvious, really, when you yeah. think about it. The government spends so much time... The smoking ban is a brilliant example yeah, exactly. of trying to keep us safe, trying to mm. save us from ourselves. Well, yeah. can you help our young people, yeah. please? Because as parents... There are times we need the government to step in and, and if, help us. If they've been debating this for 40 years, cars are much faster now. Yeah. Exactly. Well, the driving age was 100 years ago. And also, there's yeah. the, talking about smoking and alcohol and stuff, there's somebody in our group whose son was killed after the, the driver bought a car off Facebook the day before, £100, no driving licence, never, driving li never taken a lesson in his life and was able to buy that car and kill Gosh. somebody. And this is the thing, there's all these loopholes and things. Why... A car crashes not given the attention that all other deaths are. Well, good luck with your campaign. It's a terrific campaign. Thank you, and, Crystal. And, and our Absolutely. love and support to you and your yeah. family. Thank you I very think, much. I think mothers like you who, out of bad, try to create good is amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, you're going to have to talk now. Yeah, any moment now. The school in North London run by Britain's strictest head teacher will find out if it's been deemed discriminatory for its ban on prayer rituals by the High Court. They want to have... The, it's, it's been taken by a Muslim family who want the right to prayer at lunchtime. You're with Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Another fresh start out there this morning. Many of us seeing sunny spells. There will be a few showers, but it's not as many, not as heavy as the ones we saw yesterday. Still, it's a bit of a wet start over parts of Lincolnshire, down through East Anglia. A fair few showers scattered across Wales as well. We'll see more coming into northern Scotland through the day. Still a fairly brisk breeze, but not as blustery, not as gusty as yesterday. We should see some decent spells of sunshine over parts of North Wales. Uh, northern England and southwest Scotland. Temperatures still struggling a little bit, feeling fresh in that breeze, but generally with a bit more sunshine, the wind's a little lighter than yesterday. It does feel a little warmer, or it certainly will do by this afternoon. Going to turn quite chilly overnight, though. More showers packing in across northern Scotland with a, a gusty wind blowing here. We'll see a fair few showers drifting across northern England and Wales through the night. They'll crop up across parts of the south during the early hours. It will be a chilly old night, though. Four or five in towns and cities, lower across parts of northern England, southern Scotland. A hint of blue on the chart. Some rural spots could easily start below freezing uh, tomorrow morning. So, again, a chilly start, but for many, quite a sunny start tomorrow. Main exception to that will be Northern Ireland. Cloud moving in here, uh, a dull, damp day, and some of that rain will spread to southwest Scotland, North Wales later on. Sprinkling of showers over parts of the east, but again, many places dodging the showers, dry and bright, but again, for most, on the cool side.
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Now, those vegans are always telling us, aren't they, how marvellous their diet is, the <laughs> pinnacle of good health. But I think they might be wrong. I've always suspected they might be wrong. Well, a new report has found that fake sausages and burgers <laughs> are no better for the heart than meat. They were even found to cause worse blood pressure. So that explains um, <laughs> Beverly Turner's um, <laughs> temperament. I'm definitely so, not vegan. So, so we're, only, we're only joking. We're joined now by vegan comedian Dave Tourner. Dave, you've been <laughs> found out. It's no good for you. Bad blood pressure, bad for your heart. Just have a proper sausage, man. <laughs> I, I love how happy you are that this has shown how bad the vegan diet is. I, I love that. We're thrilled. We're what? feeling a little bit um, pleased with ourselves because we've all been very sceptical. <laughs> well, can I can I absolutely point out you you don't have to. It's not mandatory. You don't have to eat these. It feels uh, like meat. it. Oh, no, I'll, I'll, hang on, Dave. Let me pull you up on that. I went to a coffee shop at the weekend with yeah. my girls to get myself a latte and a little snack for them, and on sale with these lovely looking chocolate chip cookies, vegan. Mm. And so I said to the woman, how rubbish are your vegan chocolate chip cookies? And she said, actually, they're all right. And I said, do you have any that aren't vegan? She said, no. And I said, oh, in that case, I'll have a piece of carrot cake, please. Because you say it's not mandatory, but it's becoming mandatory. Oh, wait, it's, it's not. And also, that is the worst <laughs> salesperson I've ever heard in the world. <laughs> like, uh, how can you vegan cookies? They're, they're all right, they'll do. <laughs> She's I, probably I honest. Think that... Yeah, go on. She's probably honest. Go on. I, I like that. Well, look, look, you don't have to eat these uh, vegan no. substitutes. I think we can all agree fruit and veg generally quite good for your diet. But if the headline to this is that you can be an unhealthy vegan, I, I don't think that's shocking anyone. I find Just... it mad that people... Go on. Just so people know what the report says, pr producing these plant-based meat alternatives often involves a substantial amount of processing. They can be products can be high in salt, saturated mm -hmm. fat, and additives to match the taste and texture of real meat products. You've been found out, Dave. But I, I think the big difference between uh, being a vegan and not being a vegan is I know I'm better than you. And I think that's <laughs> the biggest difference, <laughs> that I can sustain myself on my own superiority. So. Give us an idea of what you eat in a typical day then, Dave, as a vegan. Well, this is what I find really funny is my, my diet's actually terrible. Because, like, people think that vegans are, like, really thin, but actually it's a lot of bread, a lot of hummus, a lot of mm. falafels. Like, actually, like, I when I went vegan, I put on loads of weight because it's actually really stodgy, starchy, fatty it's food. It's all the processed so, food. It's all the processed just, food you're eating. Yeah, and, and also, I, I will absolutely admit, some of the processed food, amazing, but a lot of vegan cheese. That Like, I, I will yeah. put my hands up that vegan cheese is, is terrible. There's no substitute for the proper thing. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. Brilliant comedian. He happens to be a vegan. We'll forgive him. Dave <laughs> Chornet there. Right, we've got breaking news. This is about the Michaela Community School oh, in London. No. We brought you this story a couple of months ago. Well, Catherine Burble Singh has lost 
her High Court challenge against its ban. No! We'd, sorry, it is breaking news. The Muslim student has lost the case. I said the school would win. Catherine Burble Singer's won. We'll tell you all about it in a minute. Victory. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to the latest weather update from the Met Office. It's another cool and breezy day out there with further showers, but a greater chance of sunny spells compared with yesterday. We've got this northerly airflow at the moment, hence the cool breeze. Plenty of isobars across the UK and plenty of showers as well carried through on that northerly breeze. Some of these showers will be lively, heavy downpours here and there, but they'll be on and off. There'll be a decent chance of sunny spells in between the showers. Certainly a better chance compared with yesterday. And as a result, with slightly lighter winds, it's going to feel a bit more pleasant. The temperature's still a little below average for the time of year. We'll see further showers coming through on that breeze overnight. But increasingly, the showers will be more confined to the north of Scotland, eastern parts of England, a few toppling into Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and the southwest. But in between, lengthy clear spells forming, lighter winds as well. So a touch of frost possible as we begin Wednesday, but plenty of bright skies out there. Fresh start, yes, but southern Scotland, northern and central England, southern England and parts of Wales as well enjoying long spells of sunshine during the morning. The cloud will build into the afternoon and by the afternoon, most places will be rather cloudy. A bit of rain coming into Northern Ireland, further showers into the east, in between a slice of fine weather and feeling pleasant enough. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my cost? argument for no, me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
I'm Gloria De Piero. This is GB News, Britain's election channel. Breaking news this morning. Great Big news. news. You remember we brought this to you in January. This is the Michaela School in North London. They have been found not to be discriminatory for its ban on prayer rituals by the High Court. Now, this was a Muslim Pew student challenged the ban on prayer at school. She said uh, it was discriminatory and uniquely affected her faith. But the judge in his ruling said she knew the rules when she went to the school. There is no prayer for any group in that school That's and right. Catherine Burble Singh has won this case. She's one of the most significant head teachers in Britain. Uh, she's amazing. She's my hero. I love the way that she teaches those students. That school is the most successful across the country in Certainly terms of is. the improvement when they arrive in year seven compared to the results they get when they leave after doing A levels. She did speak to GB News in January when this action was first taken to court. Here's what she said then. We all need to recognise that all of us need to make sacrifices for the betterment of the whole so that we can all get on and that schools play such an important part of this. Now obviously if your school is one where the children roam the corridors and the children do whatever they like during lunch, then I suppose you might choose to have a prayer room and that's fine. You know, I'm not suggesting that all schools shouldn't have a prayer room. But I do think that if a school's ethos is such and building is such that they cannot have a prayer room, then they should be allowed to not have a prayer room. I'm having to support staff right now. They come and see me very frightened. Um, uh, they're really scared. And gosh, last year, my goodness, I mean, that, that was the worst. Um, it was, uh, I mean, they're, they're, uh, it's not right that um, uh, a head teacher or teachers should be put under that kind of stress because they're just trying to do their jobs. And this is very so hugely significant. The court saying the head teacher can run the school the way she wants to. Really important. Because if she'd lost this case, there must be every chance she might have gone and quit. The judge has also said, by the way, uh, that the head teacher, Catherine Burbison, had been justified in suspending this student uh, based on the account of a teacher that she'd been rude and defiant. Mm -hmm over the prayer row. Yeah. Catherine Rebel Singh's argument has always been every child in my school must compromise based on their faith. There are mm. Christian children who don't want to do revision on the Sundays. Well yeah. tough. Um, there were some children, I think Sikh children, who didn't want to eat eggs on a Friday. Yeah. I think it was... I, anyway, sorry. There'd be Jewish kids my on a Saturday, Jewish Sabbath. Kids, that's right. You so, might have to do a school said, event. everyone compromises and I don't divide by faith and if I have to give a Muslim prayer room at lunchtime for 300 children it undermines the ethos of my school it will cause chaos and it would take away the need to do these lovely lunches that they do where they bring everyone together Theo Chikumba is outside the High Court now Theo what happened? Yeah, well, in the last few moments, uh, we have learned that a Muslim student has lost its challenge uh, that it brought against the school that they attended, Michaela, a community school in Brenton, North West London, after claiming uh, that the policy that they had on prayer was uniquely affecting her faith and saying that with prayer as one of its five pillars. Now, just last year, there were reports of students who were, pra who were praying on the school grounds and using blazers uh, on the floor during school time. Now, there was a two-day hearing which took place here at the High Court, and the court heard how um, the school uh, allegedly had its stance of kind of discrimination, uh, which makes religious minorities feel alienated from society. But the school did defend its policy uh, with a lawyer for the school saying it argued uh, against it, saying it's justified and proportionate after it faced death uh, threats and bomb threats linked to religious observations uh, at, on site at that school. And also during that two day hearing, the head teacher uh, posted a lengthy explanation regarding uh, their decision, uh, saying that uh, where children of all races and religions can thrive. This is, de this is a decision um, that is uh, benefiting everybody and they don't want the school uh, to become a secular school. Now, the school itself has around 700 pupils and roughly half of them are Muslim. Uh, the High Court with this ruling. Let us and know you, your thoughts this and morning. And you absolutely know that Catherine Burble Singh will be hard at work in her school 
doing what she does best, teaching great, teaching kids. And she talks about the stress of last year, particularly the well, end of 23. There were, were death there threats. Was, there were death threats uh, linked to her decision to refuse to give in to the demand for uh, a Muslim prayer room. Mm. Let's speak now to Dr Taj Hage, who is the founder of the Oxford Institute for British Islam. Um, good morning, Taj. Thank you uh, for joining us. Um, do you take this as a triumph of unity, actually, and a means of avoiding more division in schools? This is very heartwarming news. I mean, for, for years, the, the Muslim fanatics and radicals have just been spouting the rhetoric of being foreign and outsiders and being aliens to this society. No. Muslims need to become integrated, inclusive, and part and parcel of this society. So the news today is really, really inspirational because it uh, puts the brakes on all types of fanaticism and extremism. And what many people don't know, yes, Muslims are required to, to pray five times a day, but did how many non-Muslims know that you could actually postpone the prayers? For example, so if you're at school during lunchtime, you can come home in the afternoon after school and you make up that prayer. This applies both to adults and to children. So this idea that it has to be done during school hours is nonsense. And when we have countries like Morocco and Saudi Arabia and various other places don't insist on children praying during the school hours, why is it necessary here? Yeah. Some, some of the people backing the student have been, as you know, Taj, very vocal and very critical of the head teacher. Uh, but it's difficult, to, I think, to accuse her of discrimination when she has applied the same rule to all faiths. Absolutely. She should be congratulated for be, having a, a standards that apply across the board. You know, you, we can't make exceptions, whether for Hindus, for Jews, for Christians, for Muslims, or whatever. What, what's going to happen to this uh, cohesiveness? We all talk about cohesion in the society and how this is such a huge problem because it, it, it's praying at the edges. And when we have Catherine Burble Singh and others trying to uh, bring, bring about a, a united, uniform society, uh, 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 s uh, school, we should be applauding her. And so th this is fantastic news, and I hope that uh, uh, people mm. like you and others will really make this point, that yes, prayers are required, but Muslims can postpone these prayers to later in the mm. day when they're available. For example, I'm a heart surgeon, which I'm not. But I'm a heart surgeon, and I have to deal with someone who's really having a, 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 a big issue. And this is during prayer time. So what do I do? Do I pray or do I treat my patients? No. I, <laughs> I, I treat my patient. And so it's, Islam is a flexible thing. It's just these uh, uh, Wahhabi fanatics and other Saudi uh, extremists that are insisting that we should be following to the, to the letter when it's, Islam is actually much more uh, accommodating mm. than this. Taj, schools, I always think, are a bit of a microcosm of our wider country and society, actually. And Catherine Burble Singh talks very eloquently about having to proactively bring people together in the school from different faiths and different religions. Otherwise, she says her playground would be little tribes of children who don't play with each other. What do we learn from her about how we do that with our wider community in terms of inter encouraging integration? I mean, she's uh, knocking heads together with sort of uh, velvet gloves, you know, I mean, we're bringing, dragging them, kicking and screaming, but some people, because especially Muslim parents, they teach their children, there's a them and us, that, you know, the, the them are all going to hell and the us, we are going to heaven. And so th this type of indoctrination and conditioning and brainwashing is very, very dangerous for our society. And so when Catherine Burble Singh comes about with these uh, a, a, a lunchtime get-togethers where people are, are, are sitting next to each other and, and, and uh, uh, next to other people of other faiths, this is a wonderful thing, and we should be applauding this, and, and we should be giving her a medal. In fact, I don't know why she had been made a dame yet. Yeah. Well, do you <laughs> what, on, on a broader point, Taj, if she'd lost... Um, and, and, and that, that had been enforced, it could be that that rule could then be applied to every school in the country. Well, I mean, I think your presenter here, I can't remember her name, you actually said uh, uh, she had lost at the beginning of the... Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, the breaking news came out and we both yeah. misunderstood Got it. Way around. Anyway, yeah. uh, when you said that, I had an, uh, my heart actually sank at that precise moment. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, lost. my Lord. And, uh, oh, uh, my Lord. You know, so... so so I think this is a great moment for Britain and, and, and for Muslims because Muslims need to be told in no uncertain terms that if you want to live here, you need to do the three I's. And what, what are the three I's? You've got to become inclusive. Yes. You've got to become integrated. 
And lastly, and in, with inverted commas, you got to become indigenous, meaning you can be part and parcel of this society. So we are promoting the three eyes of Islam, inclusivity, integration, and indigeneity. And I think and this we, is very important. And we know, Taj, that some schools, it, this has been a problem with some people who set themselves up as Muslim community leaders. We know there's a school in the Midlands where a teacher is still in hiding because he had the temerity yes. to use a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad in a lesson a lesson which he taught in that school many times before. Yeah, I mean, look, at this idea that you can't show a picture, cartoon, a photo of Muhammad is nowhere to be found in the Quran. In fact, all of these things, they are non-Quranic, un-Quranic. I mean, this idea of a woman covering her hair, the hijab, it's nothing required in the Quran. This thing about women covering their faces, not required in the Quran. Men having uh, big, wild, bushy beards, not in the Quran. So, in fact, when you look at anything that Muslims say that is part of their faith, non-Muslims, people like you in the media, need to examine and find out, well, is this actually part of Islam or is this part of culture masquerading as faith? I was just going to say, so when we do see people in full face burqas and, and the beards and stuff, that is importing a culture from certain yes. countries as opposed to what is in their religion. And you would say, well, that is not the culture that we have here. How do we push back against it, though, Taj? Well, I think we, then we need to really make the, the differentiation and teach Muslims to make a differentiation between culture and creed. The two are not the same. Customs and religion are not the same. And they need to understand that their customs from Bangladesh or Pakistan or Saudi Arabia or whether they are, come from, that is not Islam. That is purely cultural and traditional and has got no basis as far as scriptural foundation is concerned. Mm. So, um, if you had a message to the family, the, fa the family supporting this student, uh, Taj, what would it be? Well, I'll, 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 I'll tell them very respectfully, yes, children, adults should pray. This is part of our faith. But do we have to do it at lunchtime? Because it's, it's only one prayer at school, OK? This is the lunchtime prayer. Uh, the, the early morning one, late afternoon, evening, night prayer time doesn't fall under school hours. So I'll ask them very respectfully, why can't this young lady or young man pray when she comes home? Because this is allowed in the faith. There's no, nothing in the faith that says you must actually do it under, at the stipulated time. The only proviso I would add, though, and I, we should be honest, is that the Friday prayers, Okay, it's like the uh, 11 o'clock C of E service uh, on a Sunday. The Friday prayer is a one o'clock prayer uh, uh, throughout the Muslim world. I mean, the midday prayer. Now, uh, those children, uh, I don't know what the solution should be, but uh, um, and that's a, a mandatory prayer. The others, are, by, by the way, are flexible and individual and can do it whenever it suits you in terms of your personal uh, schedule. But the Friday prayer, we need to uh, ask. Uh, one way of doing dealing with this is that you, you lengthen the school day during Monday to Thursday, and then you, you shorten the day on Friday uh, to about 12.30, and then the Muslims can go have their prayers and the rest can go home. Taj, we're short on time, but I'm interested in your own, just briefly, how unpopular are you among some elements of the Muslim community? Ex exceedingly. I'm labelled as a heretic and as a non-Muslim and so forth, but this is, <laughs> this is par for the course when they don't have answers. You see, I ar argue my perspective based on the Qur'an, I can give chapter and verse. They cannot. So when they cannot do that, their only recourse is to call me a non-believer. And so I don't really take that seriously because it's my duty as both as a Muslim and as a Brit to say, listen, this is not what is required from my religion. OK, well, listen, we thank you, Dr Taj Hage, from the, uh, he's the founder of the Oxford Institute for British Islam. And do you know what I want to thank him for particularly? For a reason. Bringing people together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Bringing people together. We need more reasons to get on with people, not and, fight with them. And how fascinating that it is not set in tablets of stone, that they have to have that yeah. prayer, meet pre-prayer, to pray at lunchtime. They can do it, she can do it when she gets home. That distinction. And I wonder if she does. And that distinction between culture and, and religion. religious yeah, faith big. is absolutely critical. We're going to have more reactions to this huge, big court verdict today. If you're just tuning in or listening on the radio, uh, Catherine Burble Singh, who's the head teacher of the Michaela, Michaela School in North London, has won uh, 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 and defeated a move by a student to insist that there has to be a prayer room for Muslim prayer at mm. lunchtime in the school syllabus. And the court has backed the head teacher 100%. Wonderful. It's an important victory. This Your is Britain's newsroom. GB News.
GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. TFL bosses have come under fire after banning an advert... Oh, God. <laughs> they banned an advert for a comedy show because it had a hot dog on it. Because that supposedly promotes obesity. The comedian Ed Gamble has swapped the image of the fast food favourite in favour of a cucumber instead. And there's the cucumber on the plate. So, is the UK turning into a nanny state? Let's talk to former presenter of Fat Families, Steve Miller, and nutritionist Olivia Parry. Good to see you both this morning. Olivia, it's a comedy show. Um, he's not promoting eating hot dogs, is he? Is this just a load of nonsense? The thing is, we have a huge problem with overweight and obesity in this country. We're fourth in Europe. Um, it's big business. Advertising for food companies is big business. They make, you know, they make so much money. You just have to switch on primetime TV to watch, you know, food after food advertisement. And we, it, it's for the youngsters as well who don't have the nutritional education. We're not taught cookery in school anymore. People go to go to college and to university. They don't know how to cook. But and it leads forgive me, to, forgive like, me for jumping in, Olivia. Know. Forgive me for jumping in. But the, but the, the whole point with this is it's an advert for a comedy show. Yes, I know. But this is a this is a wider issue. I think it's a load of old tosh. To be quite honest with you. It's a hot dog. In fact, I wish they'd have put onions on the hot dog. A bit of what you fancy won't hurt you. You should eat 80 20 anyway. You know, we talk about a nanny state. I actually think, arguably, we're becoming an authoritarian state. Opinions banned. Comedy banned. The England flag banned. It's like we've got to wear a virtual muzzle. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. This is GB News, Britain's election channel. Eleven seventeen is the Britain's News on GB News. Andrew Pizzo Turner, the panel are back. Former advice Boris Johnson, Lord Colville Ranger, and GB News senior political commentator Nigel Nelson. We're going to carry on talking about Catherine Burble Singh's win. Um, Nigel, um, uh, with her? Yes, um, I think it's absolutely right that a head teacher should decide uh, how his or her school operates. Yeah. Um, so, um, provided that you that you're banning prayer or any religious religious um, uh, periods in school um, for everybody. Yeah, which she's done. Which which she did. That is fine. If you don't want to send your child to that particular school, then you find a different school where, where you can go and, and pray. And, and the judge in his ruling said that the, the student who took the case to court was fully aware of the school's rules when she joined. Uh, and so... Oh, that's what I mean. You go, to, you go to a different school. I mean, if, yeah. you, if you choose to go to a Church of England school, you will have a, um, a, a, a religious assembly which will be yeah. based on the Church of England. Same with the Roman Catholic school, yeah, yeah. and so it goes on. It, it, parents can decide whether they want that to happen for their child. Yeah. Um, if you go to a school which has a different kind of ethos and turns around and says, no, we're not having any of it at all mm. for any religious group, um, then that school has the right to do that. Culver, there may have been Sikhs at that school. We're not, I'm not sure. Highly likely there are. Mm. Um, it's part of North London in the Wembley area. Um, how do you... Would, would, it, would it be an issue of great offence to you if um, your Sikh children were at that school and they weren't allowed to pray? No. No, because I, I actually find religion in school slightly challenging. I, I, I'm, you know, I, I was at the, in an era when we went to school. 
back then, we'd stand outside, those of us who were non-Christian, outside of assembly. Mm. And we always wondered what was, what was going on inside. But there's something about... Were, they, were you deliberately excluded or did you choose to exclude yourself? We were asked if we wanted to stand outside. We could go in. Right. But it's much like actually at the Lords where prayers happen in the Commons every morning. Yeah. And you can choose if yeah. you want to be inside for prayers or not. Yeah. And I think that's an option. But in school, this is not just about uh, this case. It's about authority, authority of the school to run its school as it sees fit. Catherine Burblesing has made a stand, and she's tackling, she does quite regularly now, a stand for common sense, her approach. And if we have people challenging the authority of the school to say, well, we're just not happy in how this school is being run, in, in a manner that says we want it to bend to our will, we end up in a sort of chaos that says but everybody can say, I want this, I want that, and you can't have a set approach to education. Yeah. But we just, we just heard then from um, the, the guy who founded the um, Oxford Institute of British Islam, and he was saying that he is unpopular because he talks about wanting more people to come together, and he doesn't like this, what he described as a sort of a fundamentalist mindset around Islam, which manages to gain ground repeatedly. And we've had 13 years of conservative rule here, and we've got to the situation where this pupil feels so sufficiently empowered in this country as a Muslim girl that she can take her headmistress to school, backed by forces within her community who are paying for that, who want to see that happen. That's happened under a Conservative government who've had their eye off this issue, I think. I, I know exactly what you're saying, but because that's kind of the point I was trying to make, mm. but you've made it better. Yes, I think the authority, we need to look at where authority stands and who can challenge it and how they can challenge it and what society is trying to achieve. We, we've seen this, I dare I say, in the demonstrations, policing of demonstrations mm. at the moment. You know, yeah. where is the authority? How is the policing? All of these things are challenging those structures, whether it's policing, whether it's education, and we need to be firm in how these structures work mm. and accept that they have their decisions and they operate in a manner that, yes, they can be challenged, obviously, if there are things going wrong, but fundamentally, they need to be consistent and they need to be respected. And unless they're doing something fundamentally wrong, mm. then you can challenge it. In this case, it was just a case of they're not happy of how the school is approaching their... Mm. Their own and, religion. And, 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 and also, Nigel, the, the disturbing thing about this, OK, the parents have, can have their issue with the way Catherine Burbison runs a school, but a death threat? Firebomb threat. Yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, a, it was appalling what, that, what the, the, the fallout from there. And I think I sort of disagree with Bev a bit about the, the student who went to court. I think the student has every right uh, to go to court. It's just the court, in this case, made the right decision. Gosh, but the schools could be the courts could be cluttered with all the issues I had when I was at school with what I didn't like yeah, about I, the school. I, I, I mean, where, it, it's, it's what what do you go to court for? Yes. Yes. And I think we have to really examine that because quite rightly, as Andrew says, we're going to our courts are full anyway. In yeah. terms of cases that are going through. You get all if, these vexatious cases. More and more things. But there must have be a right. To, I mean, the point is there must be a right to challenge it. And I think that in a sense, this student did. Don't you do that through the Parent Teachers Association? Well, you may start there. Yeah, you may start there, and you wouldn't have got anywhere with uh, Catherine Burble Singh on that. But she made a position absolutely clear. Um, the one thing the court has done is made a ruling that will apply effectively to the whole country. Yeah. So it was important to get this principle mm. of law sorted out. And that's my point about, yes, you, you, you can't stop people uh, objecting to it. It's just that, um, in this case, the court came to the right Let decision. Let me give you a quote, Nigel. This was actually, I've just dug out an article that I wrote for GBnews.com, and we'll put this on. This was in January, and we'll put this back on the website today, I think. But she says, people tend to just stick with their own. And then you end up with schools where you have the Hindu kids here, the Muslim yeah, yeah. kids there, the black Caribbean kids there, and the black African kids there, and so on. And those kind of divisions aren't helpful, not if you want a multicultural society to succeed. You don't hear anybody ever say that, Colvin. Why aren't the Moorhead teachers feeling brave enough to say that? You shouldn't have to feel brave to say that. It's amazing you having to say she's brave yeah. to say something that we can all see, or she can see. And I think that's because she's afraid of being cancelled, being afraid of, of being taken to court on saying things. How yeah. has that happened and under a Conservative government I, for 13 years? I, I think, Bev, you're, you're right about it, but I think society has changed broadly 
and whether it's up to politicians to regulate society or whether it's society to say, this is where we are. I think we need to keep testing ourselves. This is the, we weren't going to get to it, but there's a piece by Dawn French today in the Daily Mail where she's yeah. talking about how it's courageous to speak out, yeah. how she feels that people are scared because of cancel culture. Mm. Yet we live in a society that calls itself more inclusive mm. and more open to freedom of speech than the ever irony. before. So there's a contradiction here that's going on. Yeah. And we have to hold the mirror up to ourselves and say, are we happy about and she, it? And that, it, that all feeds into it, doesn't it? I mean, that's quite right what Dawn French is saying. I mean, she, she felt if she was speaking out, she wouldn't get me work. Yes, I mean, that, 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 uh, I think what her message was, was can we all be a bit kinder? Well, yeah. That was the way that, yeah. that I interpreted what she was talking about. I mean, I think on the, on the school front, a lot of head teachers are doing what we're talking about here, that my daughter went to a Church of England school, yeah. but the, um, the head's mission was to empower the Muslim girls. Right. So you didn't have those kind of ga gaps in the playground where everyone gravitated to one sure. or the other that it was inclusive, and that kind of is what you should be trying to achieve. And, and were there <coughs> prayer sessions at lunchtime? There, there, were, there were Church of England services, assemblies in the morning. Right, religious and, and, and the Muslim kids take, took part in those. It's up to them. Right. The, same, the yeah. same thing that, um, that Colby was talking about. It, it, if it had gone the other way, Colby, it, it, what sort of precedent would it have set? This could then... Um, uh, there would have been a clamour. Maybe we have to have a Muslim prayer room in every commercial building, uh, every public building. And I think we've, we've had some of that happening already. Yeah, it does yeah. happen already. In the name of inclusivity, we have various different things to accommodate faiths. In one way, that's a good thing. Sure. See, respecting other people's religions, faiths, their traditions. But I think we've got to be... There's a balance. And that's why this ruling, as I says, even though I'm not keen for this kind of court case to be taken mm -hmm. forward... Yes, it sets a clear precedent that this is not going to happen in schools. Heads are going to be allowed to do what they need to do. And maybe that's a message that goes out into broader society as well. We, see. we should learn yeah. from this ruling. And, and I hope we hear soon from the Secretary of State for Education, Julian Keegan, I'm not mm. holding my breath, um, or, or the Prime Minister, to, mm. to welcome this, because yes. it is such an important mm. I would agree. ruling. Yes. Well, I mean, it will, it will apply to all schools. That's the yeah. point. You've now yeah. got a precedent set here. Yeah. Um, and so that should now apply to every school in the land. Dr Taj Harjay, we spoke to earlier, Nigel, yeah. who's the founder of the um, Oxford Institute for British Islam. He said we need to make a very clear distinction between culture that is in Muslim countries, as in women having their faces covered, men necessarily needing to be bears, whatever, the culture and the religion. We very rarely do that. We are frightened to do that. I don't like seeing women walk through the Westfield Shopping Centre every weekend with nothing but their eyes on show. And that has become commonplace in Shepherd's Bush. I find, I find the burqa uncomfortable for that reason, not mm. being able to see someone's face. Equally, I do, do uh, appreciate their right to wear it. I don't yeah. see a problem with that. I mean, you know, unlike Fran France, where, we, where they try and ban it. But it's cultural, not in the Koran. Yeah, well, yes, it depends which part of the... Well, of he, the, the, he said it's not in there. Yeah, and he also mentioned, which I thought was interesting, about cartoons, about, yes. about um, well, pictures of the, yeah. of the Prophet Muhammad. Yeah, in hiding. Yeah, um, I, and the only thing I would say about that is that um, it would be wise to avoid... Offend, why offend people unnecessarily? Um, rather than go into the theology of it, was oh. what he was talking People've about. People have been offending Christians for thousands, hundreds of years. Yeah, but that shows... The life but of that, Brian Moving. Well, if anything, that shows that... Christianity is a fairly robust of religion. Course, it so can take as, a, it so can take a, and it can take so a joke. Islam. Well, a lot of a lot of Islam can't take a joke. No, it may be because self, it came no, 500 think, later no, than, than Christianity. It's community leaders who've been causing trouble at this school who can't take the joke. Most Muslims can. But we're now confusing various issues there. I, mean, I was talking about, I think, uh, out of respect for that religion, uh, you do try and avoid cartoons, any, ki any kind of image of the Prophet Muhammad, which is considered blasphemous. Except that is completely at odds with a, with a British culture, which would be that everybody and anybody yeah. is fair game, because yeah. comedy satire. particularly and satire is a very important yeah. part of our... But I'm back British to the be, ki the, be, the be kind bit and be respectful but bit. But you see, I don't read this as be kind. What Dawn French has said, I don't know about you, Covey, but what Dawn French has said here, I don't hear her saying be kind. I think she's saying we should all be allowed to say what we want. Yeah. I agree. But she also says, say, say, say we, don't know as well. I mean, she I think said, that... Yeah. She's saying that we are having to be... We are being scared. Yeah. We can't speak out. Yeah. 
and that's not right. And then because we're fearful of being cancelled and not getting work and etc. Yeah, et yeah. Society will react. And I think that's what she's saying. She's being brave, mm. saying that. So I, 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 I agree with you, but I don't think she's saying be kind. She's saying society needs to be more tolerant. Yes. Yeah. Society needs to accept people can have their views. Yeah. And I think that's the same with religion. Yeah. Look, uh, although on Christianity, I would say you know there were films like Life of Brian and yeah. other things which were seen as blasphemous when they yeah. came out. But you know eventually we move on. I think. People should be able to have their religion, their faith, and how they want it. But people don't. People can show respect to them, but they should also be robust enough in not having to take offence yes. if people say something, as long as it's not intentional. Yeah. As long as it's not intending to offend. And this is where we get into that sort of and, and what this, are you trying but, to do? But the, but the cartoons have, have been used as a device in teaching in schools for years, Nigel. Well, I mean, the, 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 I'm not sure the policy of that particular school was right in the first place. Right. I mean, I, I, if you know that you are going to uh, offend a number of people um, uh, and seriously offend them because they think it, it, it is um, uh, blasphemous to show images of the prophet, I do think you have to respect that. You can still discuss it. There's no reason you can't discuss in class what has happened with the cartoons, what happened in Denmark, what yeah. happened at, uh, in France. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure it's a very clever idea to show them. Right. Um, so, um, Catherine Burble Singh, um, Damehood, at the very least. I, I think not just for this, Andrew, but her constant yeah. ability yeah. to fight for what is right what mm. is common sense, and as Dawn French has put, to be brave and speak out. Yeah, yeah. and, and you know, she has, she, and she's been subjected to vicious abuse, and she's going to get a load more today. Yes, and, and I did see her recently. She was she was at a book launch in the House of Lords, and uh, I, I congratulate her on mm. being consistent, on being determined, and being robust in a mm. world where it's really hard to be those she's things. She's fearless, yeah. and I think of? it's a triumph. Pretty good. We've got Dame, to go. Dame, good for her. Yep. Yeah. I'm or, so or in the House Nigel. of Lords. Well, we've got to move on. I'm yeah. sorry. Yep. Yeah. Uh, right. Tatiana's waiting very patiently. Here she is with the headlines. Bev, thank you and good morning. First, a recap of the news from the High Court this morning, where a Muslim student's challenge against a London school's ban on prayer rituals has been rejected. The student argued that the ban at Michaela Community School was discriminatory and unlawfully breached her right to religious freedom. However, the school said allowing prayers risk security threats and could undermine social cohesion among pupils. The judge upheld the school's position, highlighting safety concerns and the need to maintain a stable learning environment. The Education Secretary says today's ruling should give all school leaders confidence to make the right decisions for their pupils. In other news, a woman has been charged with the murder of a baby discovered in a woodland in Cheshire 26 years ago. Baby Callum was discovered close to the Gulliver's World theme park in Warrington in 1998. 54-year-old Joanne Sharkey appeared at Warrington Magistrates Court today charged with Callum's murder and concealment of the birth of a child. She was remanded in custody and will appear before Liverpool Crown Court on Thursday. Rishi Sunak's due to speak to Benjamin Netanyahu later about a de-escalation of hostilities with Iran amid concerns the crisis could spiral out of control. Despite continued calls for restraint from across the world, Israel has vowed to retaliate against Iran's major missile and drone attack. Reports suggest Israeli forces have paused their planned ground offensive in Rafah to focus on their response against Tehran. However, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi says even the smallest action against Iran will be met with a severe widespread and painful response. Social media platform X is planning to start charging all new users a small fee to interact with posts. The site's owner Elon Musk says charging new users to like and reply to tweets is the only way to stop what he described as the relentless onslaught of bots and fake accounts. Last year, a pilot scheme was launched in New Zealand and the Philippines, which charged a $1 a year subscription. It's reported the trial will now be rolled out more widely. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts.
for exclusive, limited edition and rare gold coins that are always newsworthy. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2451 and €1.1712. The price of gold is £1,907.28 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,842 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Up at noon, good afternoon, Britain, with Tom and Emily. What's coming from the show? I suspect we know a little bit of what's coming up. Oh, yes. just a tad, Emily. Uh, uh, we... We're certainly going to be reflecting on this ruling. What a victory. Fantastic. I'm absolutely delighted if I may share my comment on yeah, that. Yeah, we yeah, are. Yeah. Um, because Unanimity, it's absolutely yeah. ridiculous. And she's issued a, quite a long statement, again, setting out the reasoning behind the ethos of her school. She, uh, she underlines how uh, Muslims at the school are not an oppressed minority. They, they're the largest group at yeah. the school. She outlines how much bullying and harassment there was between the students, trying to encourage, force other students to pray, and it had become this Ramadan. massive thing. And that one of the girls was forcing other girls in the school yeah. To, yeah. to do Ramadan and not eat. Mm. So the children were sitting there, and she was noticing the kids that weren't eating, mm. and saying, come here, why aren't you eating? Well, she says, I have to do Ramadan, or I'm not a good enough Muslim. Like, this particular mm. group of children there were causing all sorts of problems. But isn't yes. this good? Our authorities do have some authority still. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, Excellent. It's, 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 it's a rare sort of example of there's an of adult a in the room. Yeah. There's an adult um, in the room. But is this a significant? <laughs> is this a significant moment, isn't it? Because it really is pushing back. I think it is. If it had gone the other way, it would have been catastrophic. Well, mm. we were talking in the newsroom. Lots of people did think it would go the yeah. other way because these things tend to. Mm. Yeah. But actually, we've upheld that the spirit of a school and a head teacher's decision can trump one single parent, mm. uh, student, yeah. and their parents. Yeah. Um, you know. And the judge making the point that the student and the family were well aware of that school's ethos mm. when she arrived. Well, quite. But don't well, get quite. too happy because while there's a good news story there, we're going to zoom across to Westminster Council. Mm where there is a bad news story. For those that are becoming British citizens, uh, there is a ceremony that once you obtain your citizenship, you shake the hand of the official that is uh, granting you said citizenship. Not if you're in Westminster, you don't know. You've got the option to opt out of shaking the hand of a woman. It's absolutely Good. And this is, this is, again, this is this cultural this, issue this is we've just been discussing earlier. This is the new council in Westminster. So it was... Um, we've had Charlie Peters digging into this. Yeah. Um, it was the case when it was Conservative-controlled, there was no opt-out right. for, for, for shaking hands with a woman or, or with someone of the opposite yeah. sex. Yeah. Labour got in last year in May, and they added an option for if you want to become a British citizenship, you can avoid shaking the hand of this a woman. Is, this is the new... Bright new future when Keir Starmer gets in. I'm sorry, he's if not you are. It, is he? If he you are a new it. citizen to this country, you sign up to British values. Okay. One of those is not taking your hand away from a woman. Mm. And not I'm seeing sorry. women as second outrageous. class. Outrageous. I'm not seeing women as second mm. class citizens. Exactly. Right, all that and more with Emily and Tom from midday. For now, though, we're not quite finished with your Britain's newsroom on GB News. Oh, she normally wants to go at quarter to 12. <laughs> <laughs>
And so, you see, they're on their way. If it's that organised, that lucrative, that desirable, how on earth do we ever break that chain? I th um, it sounds incredibly harsh, but I'm sure, I think if the EU uh, change uh, politically in the June elections, which I think it probably will, yes. I think they will put up, as the Greeks have done, holding camps all over Europe, the coasts of Europe, where people are reassessed, assessed, just to see who is coming in, which would be a plus, mm. as the Greeks have done, because we have no idea who is coming in. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Nana Aquia. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good morning, it's 11.40 with Britain's Newsroom on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. And we have broad smiles on our face because it's fantastic breaking news in the last hour. That school in North London, the Michaela Community School, has won its case against a student who was trying That's to right. force the school to introduce, at lunchtime, Muslim prayers. No other prayers are allowed in the school. That's right. And Ready it was face. all about the fact that it would happen at lunchtime. Yeah. That would disrupt what uh, Catherine Burble Singh, the head, sees as a very important part of their school day, which is that she says, my pupils break bread together. Yeah. She sits them around and some of them will serve and they will pour the water and they will talk. And they don't have phones. She's very strict on mobile phones, another thing I love about her. And she said that if she had to provide a prayer room, a prayer room at lunchtime, that would change all of that. So we're joined now by Sheikh Ramsey of the Oxford Islamic Centre. Uh, good morning, Sheikh good morning. Ramsey. Uh, great to see you. So your reaction you. to this news that Catherine Burbel Singh has won her court case and her decision is not discriminatory. Uh, I, I believe I believe it is it is a discrimination. I, I believe, of course, they have a right. The students, in my opinion, the students have a right, especially if, of course, it's in the month of Ramadan or so, uh, if they want to get together and and to pray. Of course, with a reasonable, reasonable, uh, 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 you know, uh, what they should give, why they we want to pray in this time, in this time, in this time. It is very important. We respect the all the religion and if they wanted and respect the right of the students you don't just slap the students mouth and say no we don't want it because of this because of this you have to cooperate with them <clears throat> it is very important to cooperate with uh, i used to be of course the, the head of education of muslim council of britain for a number of years and we we, we tried to bring all the schools um, in the, all the schools the prayer room uh, schools uh, universities uh, uh, colleges and and all prayer rooms and, and, and he was right, and they had a rule and regulation to do. However, uh, the students, the school run with, by students. Without the students, there is not a school. If they wanted to do something, they have to come and cooperate. The, the head teacher should supposed to cooperate with them and say, OK, if you no. want, no, no, for school, example, the, five the, minutes. Sheikh Ramsey, the school should be yes. run by the head teacher, not the students. No, the, the students are very important. The, the school, they should. Is that that's our that's our uh, that's our differences? If the a school and a student does not get to a school, head teachers or, or the um, the governors does not get to be with the students. That there is not going to be a school. There have to be cooperation. Well, if there the is cooperation, no cooperation, there is no school. And the cooperation yeah. is yeah. that every child of every yeah. religion compromises in some way at that school. So why should the Muslim children not compromise? No, they they, they should compromise. Of course, I. I I haven't uh, I haven't looked at the all, all the all the details which is there, but I think 
in, in my opinion, if there are, especially months of Ramadan, which they, which they very important for, very important for them to pray in the right time. Not important uh, for the Christian children. Not important for the Sikh uh, children. It is, not it is important, important for the Jewish for, children. It is for it, it's. Each, each one, you have to remember, each one has a different role and regulation. The Christian have a role, different role and regulation, timing for a prayer. The Jewish, the Jewish, the Hindus, the, the Sikhism, they are different. And, and as yes. soon as it comes to the Muslim, uh, you say, no, 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 no. And yet it's this only is, the Muslim child wrong. that's taken this to court. You're right. Because all Muslim, the other faiths Muslim, in that school, again, and there are again. many, have compromised. And it's taken no. this one girl, paid for and driven by who knows from the community, to no, change it, it, the ethos of that school and to bend the will of the head. And I'm delighted no, to say that she it is, it is. It is wrong. No, the school, again, I said, the school, you have to remember, the school and the teachers they have to work together. It is, uh, she find it in the right way. I, I'm not very sure, of course, again, what's happened. She find the right way, which have a, have a ground to take it to court. And they take it to court, but unfortunately, of course, uh, the court, because I, I I don't know, because they're Muslim, and then Muslim at the moment has been degraded very, very badly in this country. And every everything <laughs> you say, you say, oh, you're Muslim and you shouldn't do it. I would have thought, they, I would have thought they have to compromise. Shea, it has Shea to compromise. Shea, Shea, Shea yeah. Ramsey, the judge was quite clear in the ruling that, this, that when this student joined this school, she was fully aware, as was the family, of the ethos of the school and the rules and regulations of the school. If they didn't suit her and her family, there were alternative schools she could have gone to. Why go to a school and then deliberately try and disrupt what's working it, it is, successfully? It is not. It is not. She, she has. She has a right to stay in the school, and and I do not believe. And I do not believe the head teacher should should have suspend, suspended her. They have to come. No, is on, it not one just a Muslim? The judge was clear yeah. about that. He said she was very rude to teachers. That's why. A rude, that's a different. Of course, the rude being a rude He thing. upheld that rule. You must read the ruling, Judge. It's Sheikh. Yeah. You must read the ruling. Let me ask you this. Uh, no. the, the other facts of this, of course, is that this child had received one hundred and fifty thousand pound of taxpayers' money in legal aid to take this case to court as well. That's right. Would you like to see a Muslim prayer room in every single school in this country? Yes, of course, it has to be. It's a law. It's not a, 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 it's a, 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 even a police station. Is or if if a, 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 a school or or a establishment got a three hundred to four hundred uh, 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 people which they come in and go in like a police or so on, so they have to have by the law they have to have a facilities which hold, is not just a Muslim prayer room, it is called an a, a interfaith prayer room or multi-faith prayer room, which we have all has to have. If you haven't got it, you should, they should put it. Otherwise, uh, we, are, we are all under uh, one law. There's a university got, the airport got, Anywhere you can see, not only just a Muslim, He's right have that. again multi faith prayer. Really is the law. Okay, we thank you very much, uh, Sheikh Ramsey Please. of the Oxford Islamic yeah. Centre. Thank you for your uh, reaction this In morning. Interesting. Two people from the same city taking completely conflicting views. Two men very learned in the faith of Islam. Well, it feels like common sense has triumphed this morning and a, a judgment for unity rather than division. Up next, we're going to get the opinion from a teacher about this monumental ruling. You're with Britain's and it Newsroom is monumental. on GB News. Hello and welcome to the latest weather update from the Met Office. It's another cool and breezy day out there with further showers, but a greater chance of sunny spells compared with yesterday. We've got this northerly airflow at the moment, hence the cool breeze. Plenty of isobars across the UK and plenty of showers as well carried through on that northerly breeze. Some of these showers will be lively, heavy downpours here and there, but they'll be on and off there'll be a decent chance of sunny spells in between the showers. Certainly a better chance compared with yesterday. And as a result, with slightly lighter winds, it's going to feel a bit more pleasant. The temperature's still a little below average for the time of year. We'll see further showers coming through on that breeze overnight. But increasingly, the showers will be more confined to the north of Scotland, eastern parts of England, a few toppling into Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and the southwest. But in between... Lengthy clear spells forming, lighter winds as well, so a touch of frost possible as we begin Wednesday, but plenty of bright skies out there. Fresh start, yes, but southern Scotland, northern and central England, southern England and parts of Wales as well. 
enjoying long spells of sunshine during the morning. The cloud will build into the afternoon and by the afternoon, most places will be rather cloudy. A bit of rain coming into Northern Ireland, further showers into the east, in between a slice of fine weather and feeling pleasant enough. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tominey, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tominey Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Tom Harwood. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Well, we're going to cross to Brussels now, where Nigel Farage is delivering the keynote speech, Nigel Farage, of this uh, parish, of course, at the National Conservative Conference in Brussels. Good afternoon, everybody. The last time I was officially in Brussels was on the 30th of January 2020. It was the day before we were due to leave the European Union, and I waved my flag in the Parliament. They cut the microphone off because alternative views have never been particularly welcome here. Uh, and this is my first official visit back. And I'd like to say that it's really good to be back in Brussels and that things have improved. But clearly, they've actually got rather worse. What has happened over the course of the last 48 hours is simply monstrous. This is national conservatism. There are people coming on this platform over the course of these two days representing political parties that will top the polls in their country in the European elections of June this year. Hopefully nine countries, but who knows, it may be more than that. We have, of course, Viktor Orban from Hungary appearing on this platform as well. And yet, I mean, I knew I wouldn't be welcome back in Brussels. And having one venue cancel, well, OK, I can live with that. But for two venues to cancel is absolutely outrageous. And what you may or may not know in the audience now is that this venue, which accepted this booking last night, and we give huge thanks to the Tunisian owner of this business for his courage and allowing free speech to take place. But what is happening as we speak is he is receiving phone calls from the local mayor. The police are being encouraged to come in and shut down this conference. They have even been speaking to the caterers. So the food hasn't arrived. The plates haven't arrived. Worst of all, the drinks haven't arrived. <laughs> but I shouldn't make a joke of it. Because they have told this Tunisian owner, who believes in free speech, that if he carries on with this conference, they'll make sure he goes out of business. His wife is being threatened. This is what we're up against. We are up against an evil ideology. We are up against the new form of communism. This is nothing less than that. And if anything ever, if anything ever said to me that Brexit was the right thing to do, that leaving this place, regaining our national sovereignty, 
even if we could have carried it out better, that recognising that you cannot be an independent, democratic, self-governing nation-state and a member of this monstrous union with its ideology behind it, today has told me, I should never forget it, we were right to leave. No question. But of course, none of this comes as much of a shock to me, because for my last few years here, I found life had become pretty intolerable. There were restaurants that wouldn't serve me. Coffee bars opposite the Parliament that wouldn't serve me a cup of coffee going into work in the morning. And even the pub, even the hack pub up by the European Commission, which should have had a sign on it saying sponsored by UKIP, <laughs> given the amount of money we spent there over the years, even the landlord of my local pub in Brussels, which we frequented and we mixed with people who work with the European Commission, even Mr Juncker would pop in from time to time. And I never caused a scene, never had a row. We were just after work going for a drink. Even the pub, even the publican said to me one day, Nigel, I'm sorry, you can't come here anymore. Otherwise, the European Commission will put a boycott on our premises. So I know all about cancel culture. I know all about venue culture. And what may have come as a shock to many of you today, and perhaps hopefully to our friends in the press, doesn't surprise me at all. Because you see, when we talk about European Union, when we talk about the building of a new global superpower, when we talk about Brussels as the epicenter of the globalist project, no alternative view is allowed. No alternative view is tolerated. It's quite acceptable, of course, to say that you're sceptical, that you think perhaps integration is happening too quickly. All of that is perfectly allowed. But to question the very basis upon which all of this, all of this is done is unacceptable. I think Tony Blair summed up the European Union to me in the best way of anybody in modern times. He said that it was a project of peace. And if we go back, getting on now for 80 years, to the end of World War II, the argument that there should be a forum in which European countries should get together, the argument that the more people trade with each other, or as some would say, the higher levels of intercourse that occur between countries, but I'm not sure that always works. That that leads to less likelihood of war. And it's right, isn't it? If you trade with each other, you are far less likely to go to war with each other. So we understand why the, the idea of a closer European body, be it you know, a European Council or a European Economic Community. We understand why these things came into being in 1945 after two monstrous wars in the space of 30 years. But it wasn't very long, of course, before it was all hijacked. And it was there in the small print, in the Treaty of Rome. And I'll come back to those treaties in a moment. But Tony Blair said, this was a project of peace it is now a project of power. And how right Blair was. It is a project of power. It is a project that salami slice by salami slice takes away the power of the individual nation state and hands it to those at the center. And those really at the center with real power are, of course, those that are not elected. Now, I used to have enormous fun with Mr. Barroso when he was Commission President, when, for some reason, they put me in seat number 20 in the European Parliament in Strasbourg and Brussels with the Commission President in seat number 21. And this went on for over a decade. And I honestly think that I enjoyed my time in the European Parliament more than anybody else in the room did. They felt quite often, I think, discomforted by me. 
But Mr. Barroso used to say, but Nigel Farage is wrong. I was elected. I was elected by the European Parliament. Well, technically, that's true. But guess how many candidates we had to choose from? One. <laughs> and this is their idea of democratic accountability. It is a big battle. But you have to recognize something. What has happened here in this epicenter of globalism is the coming together of a new unholy trinity. It is the trinity of big politics, of big business, and in particular, of big banks. And having been through my own debanking crisis over the course of the last year, I can tell you they've become highly politicized too. The European Union, economically, is good for big global businesses. It builds a regulatory framework that makes it difficult, if not impossible, for small and medium-sized challengers to come up and break through in those industries. It's why if you go to Royal Waterloo Golf Club, on almost any day of the week, you will find people who work for the Commission, whose names you don't know, who have no chance of ever being fired, who will earn more than your national country's Prime Minister with a pension deal that almost doesn't exist in the modern world, and they'll be playing golf with lobbyists. They'll be playing golf with the big banks. They'll be playing golf with the big manufacturers. Because never before, never before, has a system been designed where the big companies can effectively, through the Commission, write the rules for their own industry. This is the monstrosity that we're up against. Anyone that tells you that the European Union is about free trade, forget it. It's actually a protectionist bloc that looks after a few big corporate companies. Why else would the farcical high representative for foreign affairs European Commission Vice President Joseph Borrell, why else would he, following 350 rockets, cruise missiles and drones that were fired at the State of Israel, be on the phone the next morning to the Iranian Foreign Minister saying, there, 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 that was really naughty of you, but we'll take no action whatsoever because we want to maintain the best possible diplomatic relations with Iran. Why on earth was that? Because he and this project are in hock to big business, and many of the components in those drones, and by the way, the drones that also the Russians are using in Ukraine, many of those components are manufactured by firms in, yes, you've guessed it, the European Union. The whole thing is in hock to big business. <clears throat> now, I know there are many on this platform who will argue that, we, that it can be reformed from within. And I know that those parties that are charging forwards to these, I think, very exciting European elections that will take place between June the 6th and June the 9th this year. And funny, it's the first European election for 30 years in which I will not be a candidate. I mean, not that I missed the European Parliament, but I did enjoy upsetting them on the very, very big days. And there are lots of you going to do very, very well, and you'll do it, I know, on a reformist agenda. And you will, I hope, form a very big bloc in the next European Parliament. I hope you'll be able to form a legal blocking minority. And I hope you cause lots of noise and cause lots of problems and make life as difficult as you possibly can. It's got to be no more Mr. Nice Guy, folks. Because you see, I learned something nearly 20 years ago that shaped my philosophy about the EU about globalism, and I think in the end will change your political agendas too, and it was this. 
Just over 20 years ago, we had a constitutional convention led by the very grand Giscard d'Estaing. And the constitution met, the, the convention met, and it led to an EU constitution. And Giscard stood up in a press conference up the road of the Berlimont that day with the constitution and said, with this document, we become a global superpower. But there was a problem with the word constitution. It led to referendums. You know, those dreadful things where the great unwashed get to make decisions and not the great and the good, or the unelected European Commission. Yes, that very same process that, of course, led to us leaving the European Union, something that would never have happened if we'd had to trust our own parliament. There had to be referendums, and the French had a referendum, and they said no. And a few days later, the Dutch had a referendum on the European Constitution, and they said no by a really quite big margin. And the night of that result, I was in the European Parliament, in the press bar, and there were 50 or 60 of us having quite a jolly party. Well, you know, you've got to celebrate victories in life, folks. I mean, otherwise, what's the point of being here? And walking down the corridor past me was a German socialist, a humorless German socialist. They generally are, believe me. <laughs> By the name of Joe Lynan. He'd been in the parliament for a couple of decades. He had been on the Constitutional Convention with Giscard. And you know, he was full on for an EU foreign policy without veto, et cetera, et cetera. And as he made his way down the corridor and saw what he must have thought were a gang of barbarians celebrating, I said, no, Joe, I said, come on, would you join us for a drink? I tried to do it as modestly as I possibly could. I'm not sure that went very well. And he looked me in the eye. He said, you may celebrate your little victory, but we have 50 different ways to win. And that moment of elation that I felt that European democracy was beginning to send a message to the centre that we needed to stop this and reverse this process made me realise then, if I hadn't before, that actually this is of itself an unstoppable force. It is not capable of reform or change. You can't turn the train around. You have to decide whether you stay on the train or whether you leave the train. And that moment, and then of course, they, within a couple of weeks, they scrapped the Constitution, they rebranded it as the Lisbon Treaty, they boasted that by calling it a treaty, it wouldn't need referendums, apart from one, which took place in Ireland, and guess what they said? No. But were forced to vote again. And it was that whole process of the Lisbon Treaty that changed my politics. I came here in 1999 as a young, fresh-faced businessman with a view that the United Kingdom was a square peg in a round hole. We didn't fit. Our history, our culture, our language, our relationships around the west of the world, not least of which our very close relationship with our cousins in the United States of America. So I thought, if the rest of Europe wants this, that's fine. But we should leave. After Lisbon, my view changed. After Lisbon, I now want the countries of Europe to leave this European Union to re-establish their own self-governing nation democracies and to cooperate with each other, to trade with each other, to be good neighbours with each other, if that's ever possible with the French. But you must try. <laughs> you must try. 
And so I became an opponent of the entire project, and that was the moment at which I started to be cancelled from the restaurants, from the bars, from the pubs. And I will say this to you. You know, I've heard speeches this morning already about democratising the European Union. The opportunity for that came in the Constitutional Convention, because one of the biggest debates in that convention was about the community method. Now, listen in mainstream media at the back, because you've probably never covered this before, and you probably don't care. But here's the point of why this is not an undemocratic set of structures. It is an anti-democratic set of structures. Because the fact is, it is the unelected, appointed European Commission that has the sole right to propose legislation under EU law. The Parliament can amend it. The Parliament can work out in practical terms how it should be implemented. Here's the bizarre thing. It's the civil service that propose law. It's the civil service that have the power to, 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 to change law, to repeal law. It's the elected bit in the parliament that does the job in most countries that the civil service does of working out in practical terms how this can be implemented. It is called the community method. And I challenged Jiska. I challenged Jiska during that convention. I said, look, if you get rid of the community method, if you make the European Parliament, and within that Parliament, that to be the government of the new European Union, I won't agree with it because it will still destroy national sovereignty. But you would at least have a legitimate set of institutions, provided the peoples of Europe accepted that and adopted that in their own free and fair referendum. And they didn't do it. And they will never, ever do it. They will never give away that power. And big business and big banks and all the others, who now, as I've said already, control the rules for their own industry to stamp out competition to their own prominent positions will never allow it to happen. And that, folks, is why this is unreformable. That, folks, ultimately, is why people have to leave. And it's got worse, because it's now backed up by a court that, once again, was set up with all of the best motives. You know, a European Convention on Human Rights, a court in Strasbourg, an early warning bell to try and stop the kinds of things that progressively were happening to the Jewish people in Germany and Austria in the 30s, but perhaps not being noticed around the rest of the world. Set up with the best of intentions, but now utterly and completely politicised. Difficult for any of us to change our immigration policies. Difficult for any of us to deport people who come illegally, whether it's over the English Channel or the Mediterranean Sea. And now, after the ruling in favour of this group of women from Switzerland last week, now telling us that we have no option but to implement net zero policies, even if we do it at the same time that Mr Modi who's up for re-election in India, is boasting that Indian coal production will break one billion tonnes this year for the first ever time. An unreformable system backed up by a court that has now become frankly illegitimate and gone way beyond its means. Now, folks, I don't expect you to go to the electorate in June this year saying it's time to leave. But what you have to do, believe me, if you ultimately want to win, if what you really believe in is the nation state, that it is the nation state to whom we pay our allegiance, it is the nation state to whom we pay our taxes, it is the nation state who we are prepared in times of great crisis to make sacrifice on behalf of. And if you believe the best way for that nation state to run is through directly accountable democracy, and by the way, you'd be right, and I'll go back to the beginning, the project of peace, 
there is no example in the world, no example in the world, of two mature, functioning democracies ever going to war with each other. And that was the mistake we made after 1945. We should have fostered democracy in the nation state and cooperation, not a project that has led to central assimilation. Come back to Brussels, lots and lots of you. I'll come and visit. I'll be, I'm sure Mr. Verhofstadt will welcome me back into the building. And stand up and fight for your rights. But ultimately, you must at least privately to begin with, and then publicly when the time is right, recognize there is no compromise with this ideology. There is no compromise with this new religion. And if you need a reminding of that, just think of the monstrous events of the last 48 hours and of that brave Tunisian man and his family who in the end hosted us here at this conference, who are now being threatened by the thugs and bully boys who are part of this whole monstrous ideology. Thank you very much indeed. And good luck, all of you. Right, now look, I... Um, We've got some roving mics. I understand the police are very, very keen to close this down. So if they're going to close it down, they can close it down with me on stage, can't they? <laughs> Whether it happens or not, I don't know. But I've been told there's time for questions. Do we organisers have a roving mic? No? Well, we'll do it another way. Who would like to ask a question? Gentleman there. Shout it out. So, Nigel, do you think in the British referendum, maybe what would be more predominant in that referendum, the fact that in the future of these votes is to be much more exclusive than you, which is not democracy? There is no competition. Well, the referendum question that we had was, was quite a simple one. Do you wish to stay or do you wish to leave? Um, in many ways, what might have been better would have been, uh, do you wish to regain the supremacy of law? Because then we wouldn't just have left the European Union, we would have left the European Court of Human Rights, which I now believe to be totally outdated, utterly politicised and frankly not. Good afternoon, Britain. We're watching live scenes in Brussels now as the police enter a venue hosting a conference where Nigel Farage is speaking. This is the National Conservative Conference held in Belgium. The mayor of Belgium has issued an order to shut down this venue. Uh, it says this order has been issued from the mayor to ban the National Conservatism Conference event to guarantee public safety. Uh, the mayor went on to say that the far right are not welcome in Brussels. This is quite uh, extraordinary scenes that we're watching here. Nigel Farage did address this on stage just a couple minutes ago. He says, I understand the police are very keen to shut this down. Well, in that case, they can do it while I'm still on stage. It would be quite remarkable if the police were to burst into that room where Nigel is still speaking. He's taking questions from the audience. As we speak, he's still up on the stage. Wouldn't it be incredible if the police were to storm in? And Nigel said just a few moments ago that if the police are to storm into this venue to shut down this peaceful political gathering, they can do it while he's still on stage. It doesn't look like Nigel will be going anywhere. No, it does not look. The show must go on in Nigel Farage's eyes, it seems. But yes, they gave an order, 15 minutes, to the Belgian police to shut down this National Conservative Conference. And it's not just Nigel Farage who's going to be speaking there. It's leaders from across Europe. Also, we've got Suella Braverman due to speak. Indeed. Which uh, is and, quite uh, interesting. And the uh, Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor mm. Orban. So very, very big, substantial figures here. Now, it must, we must say that we are now past the 15-minute warning mm. that was issued by the Belgian police. That was meant to be quarter past 12. Let's listen in to what Nigel has to say. ..other Arab states. So, look, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an unapologetic uh, friend and supporter of Trump, uh, but I think for all the movements that are represented here today, uh, they will find a friend in what I believe is going to be the 47th president of the United States of America when he wins on November the 5th. Yes.
the, the one inside. that planted yes, the firebomb, which shows you banning things and overtaxing things never, ever has the result that you would like it to have. Yes. Peter Cattle, Brussels Signal. What kind of impact do you think Donald Trump's possible re-election will have on Europe, the United Kingdom, the EU? It's going to be so great. Uh, no. <laughs> Look, I think, you know, all things being equal, Trump is going to get re-elected. Um, I do worry about one or two of the decisions taken by Supreme Courts in places like Arizona. Uh, that does concern me slightly. But I think, I mean, I mean Trump, Trump is as big a believer in the nation-state as I am. He believes in the democratic, self-governing nation-state. He believes in cooperation. He's opposed to globalism. And when it comes to the European Union, um, well, I never really repeat what Trump and I say in private, but I do think there are times when Trump makes me look like a Europhile um, in terms of what he thinks about Brussels and its structures. He believes in the nation state. And I tell you what, he was right about China. Absolutely right about China. At a time when very few of us recognised the threat that was being posed, he was absolutely right about, or as he would say, change their views. This is a very intoxicating place in every way. You know, you're made to feel powerful. I mean, the guys will tell you, chauffeur-driven cars, champagne receptions. I mean, it, it really is a multi-millionaire lifestyle if you're an MEP. Maybe not in terms of income, but in terms of lifestyle it is. Um, and people go soft. Also, it's difficult. Human beings normally want to be popular. They want to be liked. You've got to be a bit odd to stand up in the European Parliament and be booed every week by 500 people. Maybe I'm a bit odd. I don't know. Um, yeah, I can see what Villas is doing. He's trying to use that softening of position. Well, we've been looking here at live pictures in Brussels. Nigel Farage on stage at the National Conservatism Conference, a conference that the mayor of Brussels is currently trying to shut down. He's issued an order to Belgian police to shut down this venue. And this is the third time he's attempted to shut down this conference. This is the third venue that the conference is taking place in. And Nigel Farage has acknowledged that the police are outside and if they come in, he will continue. Ah, oh, back to Nigel. Sorry. What's your opinion on the WHO treaty, which is another global attack on the nation state? Oh, I think the World Health Organization was a monstrosity uh, during the whole pandemic, uh, refusing to call out its friends in China, uh, without whom Mr. Tedros would not even be in his position. Um, and the idea that we're going to have a global treaty signed on the 27th of May, although I think that's going to be delayed, that would give the WHO the ability to tell us we should lock down. Uh, forget it. Forget it. Um, absolutely not. We must urge our governments not to sign up to it. I think a WHO pandemic treaty is, frankly, in some ways, as big a loss of sovereignty as being a member of the European Union. So I'm completely and utterly opposed to it. Okay, I'm done. They're throwing me off. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Nigel, very much indeed. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you one of the bravest politicians in British politics, former Home Secretary of the United Kingdom, General. Well, as Suella Braverman is invited onto the stage now at the uh, National Conservatism Conference in Brussels, we can still see uh, a rather chaotic scene at the back of the room. It appears as if police have entered the building, and that issue to shut down this event was, of course, issued by the mayor of Brussels. The event, however, is continuing to go on. They're continuing to go on. Nigel Farage left the stage. He'd finished his set. Segment. And now it's on to Suella Braverman. So there you go, two key British politicians speaking just at the moment. The police gather and seem to be inside the building as well, from what we know. But yes, that 15 minute warning has very much been and gone. So will the show go on? This, Will the show go on? It's a big question because this is the third venue that the National Conservatism Conference has had to go to in order to take place today. The first two were, were cancelled at last minute. The event opened at 9 a.m. Brussels time this morning in the Claridge venue in Brussels. But shortly after opening, 
the mayor of Brussels, a member of the Socialist Party, uh, the Socialist mayor of Brussels said that the National Conservative Conference event must be shut down, the event venue must close it in order to guarantee public safety. Brussels, the home of the European Parliament, the home of the European Commission, the home of European democracy, trying to shut down an event, well, the mayor of Brussels, anyway, trying to shut down an organised event expressing difference of opinion that he may not hold himself as a socialist, trying to shut it down. And freedom of speech is a key topic for this event. It certainly is. Perhaps you should have a listen to what Suella Braverman, yes. the former Home Secretary, is having to say, because this is a very important moment for perhaps freedom of speech across Europe. And I tell you, it is an urgent task because whether it's securing... Our right, well, we're just watching Suella Braverman there in the corner of your screen and on the right, essentially, the chaos, the press, presumably people who are attending the event, the police are outside currently. It really is chaos just because a conference is taking place in Brussels just because National Conservative Conference has dared to take place in Brussels. It should be said Brussels. that this is a conference that is hosting some eminent names around Europe. Some of controversial course, heard names. From Nigel Farage, uh, Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary, Suella Bravman, the former Home Secretary of the United Kingdom. There are speakers from America, speakers from Israel, and of course, this is a conference that was held not so long ago in Westminster, in London, uh, towards the end of last year, this same conference, National Conservatism, these banners, these similar speakers were held uh, in a central London venue. Of course, it must be said that the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, didn't try to shut it down when it was held in London, but now it's being held in Brussels, and the Mayor of Brussels has sent in the police. It is quite incredible, actually, that the Mayor of Brussels, Brussels, the centre of the European Union, would wish to shut down a conference on the basis that he essentially doesn't like what they're going to say I mean, or what they represent or conservatism. He himself is a socialist, ergo we must shut down NatCon. The interesting point here perhaps is that Brussels uh, and indeed Belgium is a country governed by the ECHR. Now one of the fundamental human rights laid down in the, uh, in the convention is of course the freedom of speech. Although perhaps it seems to some of these EU institutions uh, that freedom of speech is a, is a less uh, important right than, I don't know, the right to a family life. Or, oh, but clearly, Tom, some things are far more important than freedom of expression and freedom of speech. I think this is all about the safety of citizens. Of course. The, guarantee public safety. That was the excuse to shut down this event, this venue. Uh, it, it is extraordinary. We can see on the right of our screens now just the sort of chaos, the throng of people that are, that are moving backwards and forwards at the back of the venue. We saw at least two uh, members of the police walk in, although it has to be said, we can't see many now. But we can see Nigel Farage addressing the crowd. I wonder if we can listen in to what Nigel Farage is saying there. He appears to have stopped speaking, but I wonder if we can turn up the volume here. Tell me where you want them done. And we're going to follow through as he gonna... walks Guys, through this venue. If you want to have a quick chat, we can do them one by one over here. We can try our best anyway. And Nigel, we're going to be listening in to what right. exactly who's, who's, who's going who's next? on. This is a fairly unprecedented event, Dave, event here work. with regards to the shutting down of a peaceful political gathering. He looks um, really quickly on that. He looks really um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is this is uh, a modern, updated form of communism. That, that no alternative opinion is allowed. Uh, there is not a single public order interest here at all. Have a look who's in the room. These are very eminently respectable people. Have a look outside the building. I mean, you know, there's about half a dozen people. There isn't a serious violent protest, and, and nor should there be. We've got the prime minister of a country coming. We, we've got a Roman Catholic bishop coming. Uh, we've got representatives of parties who will top the polls all around Europe in elections. This is this is this is the sort of complete 
kind of old communist style thing. If you don't agree with me, you ought to be banned, you're mad, and to be shut down. It's monstrous. But I tell you what, it's done me a favour. Because at times I think, oh, I wish the government had done Brexit any better than they have, and why haven't they tightened the borders up? And, but if anything's convinced me that leaving the European Union ideology was the right thing to do, it's the events of today. And I understand as we speak that the police did come in during my speech, but saw the cameras and withdrew. They have in their hand an order to close this meeting down. But there are only three police at the moment. Goodness knows how many people here. So they're going to gather their strength and come in and clear us all out. You've seen a lot of stuff in your time. Uh, well, you know, during your time in Brussels. Um, have you seen anything quite like this? Are you shocked? Are you On an individual b scale, yes. I mean, I was banned from restaurants, I was banned from pubs, I was even banned from coffee bars, refusing to serve me. So I'm used to this deep intolerance of anybody with a different point of view. Uh, I've never, yeah, seen, me, I've never seen it acted out. That was on a private stage. That was just me that they hated. I mean, fair enough. Um, but, but this is on a public stage. I mean, how do you think this looks to the rest of the world? Yeah. Just, just, just one more on your, on your future, Nigel. Have you decided yet? Are you going to... No. Are you going to stand in the election? Are you going to decide? Are you going to come back to the front line for reform? Where everyone wants to know what you're going to do. I'm a very lucky chap. Just had his 60th birthday. I've got lots of choices. Things are going quite well in my life. I, you know, I may, I may do it. I may not. I haven't decided. I will. Before Thank you very much, Dan. Right. Nigel, two questions for Fringe Forecast Media. Yes, of course. Yes, and, a, and a photo. Sure, by yes, of course. Okay. Well, hold on, mate. Um, Two questions, two minutes, go. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, it was the uh, yes, Brexit, you can. Where are you but actually, uh, of course in the fact, is it a true Brexit or not? Yeah. Well, it, constitutionally, it would be a true Brexit. Brexit. Uh, you know, constitutionally, we're out, uh, and the EU law, when it's made, this is not quite right. Anyway. So at that level, it is, as in, at a small level, you sound so European right now. We've just been listening there to Nigel Farage. He's described the attempt to shut down this conference as something of the old communist style of Europe. He described it as a monstrosity. Yeah, it's hard to argue with that, isn't it? He spoke about how no alternative opinions are allowed. He said this, that there is no public order issue in this room. There are intellectuals there, former prime ministers, uh, uh, a, a people... A Roman Catholic bishop. A Roman Catholic bishop, um, even. And, and, of course, it was a peaceful gathering. Now, we will be speaking to Nigel Farage very shortly on this programme to get precisely the details. I think he said there were three police officers who walked into the venue, realised it was rather a lot of people against rather a few police officers, so they appear to have gone out now to gather strength. We will be continuing to look at what is going on here, because it could well be the case that quite a few Brussels officers walk into that building and start manhandling people out. So it's a going few to be walked quite in, dramatic. thought we're going to need some backup, and now there's a little bit of a stalemate, they're gathering some strength, mm. and they could in a matter of moments, be turfed out of there, be turfed out of the building. Nigel Farage says this is monstrous. But Europe has always seen itself as a place, as a, as a beacon of, of, of liberal ideas and ideology. And yet, what are we seeing here? Precisely the opposite of those values, precisely the opposite of what the Council of Europe tried to establish, uh, tried to establish in, in, in the wake of the Second World War, the idea that people can meet, can peaceably discuss, exactly. can have freedom of speech. Well, according, apparently not to Philippe Close, the mayor of Brussels, who has ordered this peaceful event to shut down. And you know what was interesting, Nigel Farage? He said, in my private life, this has happened to me a lot. I've been banned from restaurants in Brussels, from pubs, from even coffee shops, he said. But this is on the public stage. He asked the question, what will this look like to people around the world? And I think what it will look like, you don't need to agree with what's being said in that room. You can be a socialist, you can be left-wing, you can mm. have absolutely nothing to do with Conservatives. Indeed, you can detest the ideology. Mm. You can detest Nigel Farage, but to want to shut down a conference just because people are speaking at it, mm. when what I can see, and what Nigel Farage said, at least, no public order issue, and no repeat, violent protest, this, no nothing. This is a conference that took place in London last year. And to his credit, Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, didn't attempt to shut it down. In fact, there, were, there was a plurality of media there. Yeah. A lot of media there 
uh, actually mocking it, asking questions the British way. You allow people to speak. It's often said, actually, that, that Nazism would never take off in the United Kingdom with their silly goose stepping and their, and their ridiculous uniforms. We just laugh at them because that's how you engage with speech with which you disagree. You laugh at it, you mock it, or you challenge it. You well, don't... I hope you're right that we'll stick with that mentality because it has been tested quite a lot. But yes, mm. the, the very fact that NatCon was able to take place in this country, uh, we're going to go to Nigel Farage uh, very shortly. Ah, oh, here he is. Nigel, what on earth has been going on in Brussels? Well, they don't like alternative points of view. I mean, you know, I'm used to this. I mean, when I was an MEP here in my last few years, I was banned from restaurants, banned from pubs, even banned from coffee shops uh, because I had a different point of view to that that was prevailing and backed up by big money and big business here. Um, but this is that was me on a private level. This is very much on a public stage. I mean, here we've got a NatCon conference. We've got uh, Prime Minister of Hungary coming. We've got members of European royal families coming. We've got uh, leaders of political parties who are likely to top the polls in at least nine countries in the European elections in June of this year, an audience of eminent business people, academics. I mean, this is the most respectable crowd of people you could ever possibly come across. But their sin, their terrible sin, is to question ever closer union and say so they're being chased and harassed by the local mayor. This is now the third venue after two venues cancelled, and the owner of this venue is right now, right now, uh, being threatened by the police. The police are outside the door as I speak. They will not let anybody else in. There are three police there. They have an order to close down this event, and when more police gather, that's exactly what they'll do. No alternative opinion allowed. This is the updated new form of communism. And you know what? If anything ever, ever made me think that Brexit was the right thing to do, it's the events here in Brussels today. It's the most extraordinary situation, Nigel. As far as you understand, three police officers outside right now. Do you have any indication how this uh, event will develop, whether police will open these doors, and frankly, how will you respond if the Belgian police try to manhandle you out of this conference? Well, you know, um, Tom, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not given to violence. So I, I, won't, um, I won't avail myself of it. But, no, it's pretty clear this will be closed down. They're using public order, but that actually is no excuse at all. There is no public order threat in here whatsoever. Uh, from what I can see, looking now outside on the street, there are half a dozen people gathered, but there is no public order threat of any kind at all. This is about closing down alternative opinions. This is how dangerous how dangerous the ever closer union ideology of the EU is and how dangerous globalism itself is. It's why the democratic nation state is what we have to fight for. It's the only way forward if we want to live in liberty. And Nigel, do you imagine this is about more, this is coming from more than just the mayor of Brussels? Do you think this is a concerted joint effort to try and stop this conference? <sighs> Well, it's the mayor of Brussels, it's the police, um, uh, the pressures. By the way, the catering for this lunch today, because there's going to be a break, you know, um, the people supplying the plates, supplying the food, supplying the drinks, were all directly threatened. The owner of this business, who's a Tunisian man, has been told if this conference goes ahead, they'll make sure they close his business down. This is concerted. It's big, it's nasty. Actually, do you know what? It's evil. This is cancel culture in action, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is cancel culture in a very, very big way. But, I mean, often cancel culture kicks in when somebody pushes the boundaries <clears throat> of what might be seen to be legitimate debate. All these people are saying is they think the process of ever closer union in Brussels is damaging democracy in their countries and not the right way forward. And it's that that's being closed down. It, it really is worth thinking about. It's extraordinary that all of this started very late in the day. This conference had a venue <coughs> booked, and it wasn't until the last possible moment that the authorities in Brussels mm. decided to pounce. This seems targeted, this seems particular. They wanted to make it pinch uh, at the last possible moment. 
Yeah, they wanted to make it hurt at a time when no alternative venue could be found. So, so another hotel was found yesterday morning, uh, and then by nine o'clock last night, there was literally nothing. The organisers did well. The Tunisian owner of this establishment said, look, provided what you're doing is legal and democratic, I haven't got a problem with it. And as I say, he has come under intense pressure. He is a hero. Uh, what I will be doing after this is all over uh, is publicising as much as I can the name of this venue, what it has to offer, and encouraging every tourist that comes to Brussels to come here and spend as much money as they possibly can. And Nigel, just very quickly while we've got you, your message to the Mayor of Brussels. No, I'm sorry, it's before the watershed. I really can't tell you what I think. He must be, he, he must be the most ghastly little person. Um, as I say, I'm not prone to violence, but my goodness me, what a ghastly little human being he is. Well, well there you go. go. Ghastly little human being. Thank you so much, Nigel, for taking the time to Thank speak you. to us this afternoon, and good luck with the event. Thank you very much indeed. Nigel Farage there. Well, doesn't mince words, does he? He certainly doesn't. And what an extraordinary way to open the programme. A threat of closure by the mayor of Brussels. Police outside the venue and uh, reportedly calls for backup now will be across this story throughout this afternoon because, my goodness, could Nigel Farage face the heavy hand? Just the, the craziness. Law? Most people go to these events just to hear ideas. They travel, they buy a ticket, they're excited to hear, uh, you know, what different leaders think, what different academics think, talk to each other. Mm. It's hardly a threat to... Uh, the European... Well, it could be. They see, obviously see it as it has a threat to the European Union, don't they? Mm. Any difference of opinion? Well, shall we get some more analysis now with our political correspondent, Olivia Utley, joining us live from Westminster. Uh, Olivia, this is not what we were expecting to talk to you about. Let's be candid. We were expecting to talk about many other issues, but, my goodness, uh, there is a concerted effort to shut down free association and free speech in Brussels this afternoon. Well, that absolutely is, and it, and it is truly astonishing. As you were saying there, this was the third venue that NatCon had gone to. The previous two uh, were told not to host it. This venue as well was told that they shouldn't host it, but the owner of the venue went against the wishes of the mayor. The mayor at one point was threatening to turn off the electricity in the building unless the organisers closed down the event immediately. And now, as we've been discussing, there are the, the police... Are, are gathering back up and it's thought that they will come into that venue very soon and close down the event altogether. Now, I was at NatCon in uh, London last year and, and, as you mentioned, Tom, I mean, there were plenty of media there who didn't like NatCon at all, who were laughing at it, who were mocking it. There were a few protesters outside and, actually, most of, most of the write-ups of the event were, were pretty critical. But at no point was there any suggestion that it might be closed down down. This is, a, this is something which, uh, as you say, probably would not happen in the UK. Um, it's fascinating to see what Nigel Farage makes of it all as someone who has been, uh, well, we know he was debanked very recently, personally, in his personal life. He has been cancelled many times. So watching him react to, to the cancellation of this whole event is, is, is really fascinating. And having him on the scene saying, as he did, that there is no public order threat at all. And from what we can see on our screens, that's seems to be absolutely true. We'll just have to wait and watch and see how this situation develops. Well, uh, Nigel Farage won't want to take this lying down. If he is forced to leave the venue, he'll be talking. Well, he absolutely will, and uh, at least in Britain, Nigel Farage is is very good at sort of sensing, has his finger on the pulse of the public mood. When he was debanked by uh, Nat West, it was the CEO of Nat West, Alison Rose, who who came off worst from it. And even people who firmly disagreed with Nigel Farage's political opinions thought it was completely unacceptable that he had been that he wasn't allowed to to bank uh, with Coots. So. I think if Nigel Farage is uh, pulled off the stage, uh, either literally or sort of metaphorically, at this conference in Brussels, then people in Britain, at least, uh, will be up in arms about it. And I think possibly um, over in Brussels, too. At this conference, there are people gathered from uh, across the world. We have plenty of European accents asking questions when Nigel Farage was speaking. And there will be uproar uh, if this event is cancelled by police, who we're seeing now um, gathering outside. 
Now, Olivia, I think many people will be able to think of examples in this country where uh, venues have been, through pressure from activists, yeah. forced to, to, to move events on. Comedians and, 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 and speakers will have been, will have been forced out and, and moved on through social media pressure. But I can't think of a single instance in the UK where a government official has used the power of the state to shut down a meeting that was already in progress. I mean, that, you I, might be I'm, right I'm there. really hard pressed to find an example there uh, of this. Oh, um, shall we just listen in? I think we've got Nigel Farage walking out of the venue now. I wonder if we can hear what's going on live in Brussels. Yeah. Um, not to believe they ever close the union is clearly a great sin. And do you have any idea that you've been given any reasons why they're not letting people in? Even though there are people already in. They haven't noticed the close. They, they, they will be closing again. I decided to make them a screen. What now, Mr. Farage? What happens now? And then Nigel Farage saying he's decided to make an exit no, I'm for the police. I'm not going to say that. But they will be closing this down this afternoon. They have a couple of people the police have it already. Um, and, you know, I've, I've experienced cancer conflict personally. I've had, you know, restaurants will be served here in Brussels. Or well, Olivia Utley is still with us, and Olivia, um, Nigel here choosing to leave the venue. Here is now on the stage of where there is global media, we can see that we really have opinions from people who win national matches. Olivia, Nigel Farage choosing to leave the venue here. Nigel Farage leaving the venue here, yes, uh, saying that the event, I think what he's saying there is that the event is going to be uh, shut down. As you say, this happening is, is unprecedented in the UK. We have had events where, for example, trans activists have uh, protested outside a venue where a gender critical speaker uh, was speaking, particularly in mm. universities, and those universities have come under pressure to close, uh, to, to, to cancel the event, and actually in some cases they have cancelled the event. But actually seeing this socialist mayor of Brussels close down this event uh, because he disagrees with it. And at first it seemed as though the reason he was closing down the event because, was because of sort of public order problems, potentially protests about the event. But actually it just turns out that what he's saying is, he, as he puts it, the hard right um, is not welcome in Brussels. Uh, it, let's see what happens as the afternoon goes on. Will the organisers of this event push back? Will they try and set up... <coughs> in another venue. How far is the mayor of Brussels willing to push this? And what about other politicians uh, in Brussels? What will they make of all of this? Well, that's a very, very good question indeed. Thank you very much, Olivia. We'll leave you for now. Our political correspondent, Olivia Utley, there. Now, lots of you have been getting in touch on what you've seen just now. Uh, Paul Ryder, Paul says, the mayor of Brussels, the best advert for a rise in anti-EU sentiment in Europe. Rosie says, Nigel was bang on. What a sad sight being closed down. What have they got to fear? And Steve says, this is exactly why I voted to leave the European Union. But it was interesting looking at the street there. There weren't protests. No. There was no public disorder. No. There were some people rather bemused about what was going on trying to have a cup of tea on the street. I mean, my goodness, this was not a big order. And yet, looking at those police officers standing there with their sort of leather boots and peculiar little jaunty hats, uh, as, as if they were sort of jumped up little library monitors trying to, well, they have to uh, do order told. the way that... I mean, Mike, it, it, it does smack of some pathetic form of, of authoritarianism. Well, it does indeed, absolutely. And uh, Alan says the reason they want to shut it down is because these people are becoming more popular in Europe. In upcoming elections, they don't want them to be heard. I think there's a lot of truth to that. We've seen right-wing parties in Europe take huge amounts of support. Uh, and Andrew says, what an, adver what an advertisement to all the EU countries for leaving. Really spat the dummy out. Yes, and Andrew says, is Brussels beginning to be like China? Who would want to be part of that? Glad we're out. Seems like lots of people are... Uh... Mm. Seeing this as an example of why they left the European, why they voted to leave the European Union. Gina says, so proud of Nigel, I could cry. Good for Suella too, of course, sticking with it, uh, speaking at that venue. But let's now speak to the member of the European Parliament, Charlie Weimers. Uh, Charlie, uh, this is a fairly unusual event. Have you seen anything like this in Brussels in your time as a member of Parliament? Well, there is a strong... Um 
fraction of the European Parliament that tries to cancel any event they don't like, uh, while they invite uh, convicted terrorists from different uh, Middle Eastern uh, countries. Uh, so this kind of socialist uh, abuse of power is not unprecedented, but what is unprecedented is such a big conference being cancelled live, as we see now. Uh, it's a very, very dangerous um, moment because uh, it really sends the signal that uh, uh, if the conservatives aren't in power, the left will do anything to stop them. And Charlie, what do we know about the mayor of Brussels? Does he have form on this kind of thing? Does he do this sort of thing quite a lot? Well, one thing we do know about the mayor of this Brussels uh, municipality, which, which is called St. Just de Nod, uh, his name is Emir Kier. Uh, he has been sacked uh, by the Socialist Party for involvement with the Grey Wolves, the fascist uh, organization in Turkey, which is ironic because he, he uh, feels free to tweet that so-called far-right events shouldn't take place in his municipality. Well, uh, he, he, he's the best friend of Turkey's far right. But uh, we he's not here to defend that. himself, so I'm sure he would probably deny that claim. I just need to say that to uh, make sure that we get both sides there. But, um, but Charlie, um, well, this is a very, very unusual situation. Do you think there will be any consequence from what is happening today, from these images? We're looking at uh, uh, the police outside a venue, uh, speakers including uh, a, a prime minister of a European country, senior politicians, party leaders, a Roman Catholic bishop, all being forced out today. Yeah, I mean, this is a great event, the NAFCON conference. I've been speaking there myself in the past. Uh, and I honestly, I feel sorry for those police officers because they have to, uh, legally speaking, obey the orders from this socialist mayor who's acting against the law, as far as I can see, because the, the Council of States in Belgium, which is uh, the administrative court, has uh, several times acted against these kind of cancel culture abuses uh, by uh, government officials. So, so those police officers, I, I hope they can go home soon and, and do something better than to block this event. Uh, I think this sets a dangerous precedent. Mm. Uh, I think this is exactly what the EU accuses certain member states of doing. We're seeing it in socialist-run Brussels. Um, QED. QED. Well, quite. well, Charlie, we spoke to Nigel Farage just now and he spoke about how this doesn't just impact the people speaking at the event or the people attending the event, but all the different businesses that are used to take part in one of these events. It's the venues themselves, it's the caterers, it's the people who have helped in any which way or another. And they'll feel that they can't help with these kind of events in the future. It'll become more and more difficult for conservative events like like NatCon to take place in Brussels at the heart of the European Union? Well, I do hope the organizers uh, press charges against the, the mayor of this municipality. I think it's extremely important to put him in his place. Um, but I do have some good news. This is exactly what they did against my party in Sweden. They canceled events. They had organizers block us from renting uh, venues and so on and so forth. But when uh, the population started uh, supporting us more and more and more, it became impossible to, to, to stem the tide. So um, mm. just hang in there, keep on the good fight, and uh, the, the, the uh, abusers of power will lose, ultimately. Charlie, do you think one of the reasons behind the Sweden Democrats' success in your country is because there was this attempt to shut down your meetings and to, to sort of suppress your freedoms? I think it definitely alienated a certain part of the centre-right electorate who felt that uh, the Sweden Democrats were being uh, discriminated against. Uh, I was one of them reacting quite strongly when then centre-right Prime Minister Frederick Reinfeldt said that, uh, well, the Sweden Democrats can blame themselves for, you know, having people Antifa with, you know, axes going at their uh, homes and uh, uh, 
uh, Molotov cocktails thrown into the windows and so on and so forth. Um, I, I do think that uh, um, supporting free speech is a very, very wise option for those in power, no and, matter uh, the, the color, red or blue. And, and Charlie, do you think this uh, perhaps could be seen as a bit of a desperate move on the part of the Brussels mayor? You don't feel the need to shut something down unless you're worried about it. It is desperate because uh, we're going to win on June the 9th uh, in the European elections. Uh, you see, for the first time ever, uh, we, we can uh, actually foresee a, a, a parliament that is... Uh, you know, has a conservative majority. Of course, they they are afraid because this is going to change uh, the dynamics in Brussels. They know it. Well, Charlie Weimer is a uh, member of the European Parliament for Sweden Democrats. Really appreciate your thoughts and your time with us today. What an extraordinary moment in Brussels. Well, quite. NatCon, a conference that, as you reminded us, took place safely with no real protest no. in London. In our, in our country, yet in Brussels, you have the mayor so worried about this just taking place mm. that he has to try and shut it down three times. Now, there's an effect that has been written about much online ever since the early 2000s, known as the Streisand effect. It's known as the Streisand effect because Barbara Streisand tried to cover up the fact that she'd bought a shiny new house on the coast and she tried to wipe these images from the internet. Mm -hmm. The very fact of trying to wipe these images from the internet meant that they then became spread far and wide and far more people than would ever have seen them initially ended up seeing them. It's this effect whereby if you try and shut something down, very often that can have a counterproductive effect uh, and in fact it can blow the issue much more widely. Absolutely, and that's the irony, isn't it? Yes. Most people in Brussels and indeed Europe going about their daily business have no idea that NatCon was taking place no. in the heart of Brussels. They had no idea, no intention of attending, probably wouldn't even mm. have looked it up necessarily. And now, a hell of a lot more people will know about this conference. I have to say, Emily, I was not expecting to do an hour of this programme no. on this conference. And frankly, I think that we will see a lot of this in the newspapers tomorrow, right across Europe. This will be reported uh, on tomorrow in a way that it wouldn't have been if the mayor of Brussels didn't try to shut it down. In fact, this is probably the biggest advert for this conference and the politicians who spoke at it uh, than anything that they could have done in and of themselves. And do you reckon at home that Nigel Farage is going to take this lying down? Of course he's not. He's going to talk about this. He's going to use it as an example of why we were right to leave the European Union in his mind. And he will keep banging the drum. Mm. And as Charlie Vimers was telling us, on June the 9th, Europe goes to vote. Many of the parties represented at this conference are polling in first place in their respective yep. countries. We could see a populist wave across Europe, across many different countries in those European elections. The European Parliament could look very, very different. And this event today, what we're seeing on the streets of Brussels now, could have a huge impact on swaying those votes and motivating that electorate. It could indeed. Stick with us. We'll be covering this and much more that's going on domestically and across the world. Indeed, we've spoken to Nigel at the conference. We've spoken to an MEP, Charlie Vimers, who's clearly very concerned about this direction that's going in Brussels, in the European Union. We've heard from you. We've heard from you. Um, Sara says this will not look good across Europe. Unbelievable behaviour in Brussels. Pamela says, I cannot believe what I'm watching live from Brussels. I'd never thought I'd see this in a civilised country. But of course, now we must turn to the United Kingdom. How does this affect us here at home? Are our free speech rights under threat too? And frankly, what sort of political backlash might we see as a result of all of this? Do not go anywhere. There is much more to digest. Much more to discuss, and it's all here on Good Afternoon Britain on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. 
for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Let's see what you've been saying at home. You're very <sighs> vexed about these China cyber attacks. Colin says, what the hell is our Secret Service doing? They've only just realised what China's up to. You just couldn't make it up. We could have told we you. Knew, <laughs> we knew. We're not surprised. So, quite uh... well, Colin, we agree with you. Quite why it's taken GCHQ or MI6 or whatever it is, MI5. It would be MI5 yeah. to know what's going on. And Rod has said, thank you, Rod, if you know how you vote, if they know how you vote, coupled with mass data held also on you, you do, do you not believe they can influence your decision-making process in any way.